So we're recording Excellent. and live. All right. I'll just give it a moment to allow uh, attendees to start to log on. Okay, I'm starting to see attendees log on. So uh, I'm going to uh, open up the Newburyport Zoning Board of Appeals for the hearing of February 8th, 2022. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and uh, welcome to the Newburyport ZBA hearing for the evening of February 8th, 2022. We're just waiting for one more ZBA member to log on, though we do have a quorum in the interim, and so I'm going to get things going as we are now at about 7.02. Uh, I usually take a moment uh, at the beginning of every meeting to just walk everyone through sort of the lay of the land, as I like to say, but I'll begin by just taking role, establishing a quorum. We'll then move through our agenda. We do have two continuances. Uh, and we'll take care of those first in case anyone is here uh, expecting to speak in connection with those matters on the agenda. You'll know in advance that um, you don't need to stick around. So uh, my name is Rob Champetti. I'm the chairman of the Newburyport Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, with us this evening is Mr. Mark Moore, our vice chair. Mr. Stephen Delisle, uh, we're waiting uh, for him to log on, but we expect Mr. Delisle, who's our secretary. Mr. Ken Swanton, who is a ZBA member. Mr. Walter Bud Shannon, I'm a CBA member, and Mr. Gregory Benick is our associate member. Uh, so um, we uh, also have an attendance, uh, Ms. Caitlin Sullivan, who's our city planner, uh, Andy Port, who's our Newburyport planning director, and uh, I believe we also have uh, Jennifer Blanchet, our zoning codes enforcement administrator and enforcement officer in attendance this evening. And finally, uh, our keeper of the records, Ms. Gret Gretchen Joy, who has the uh, unenviable, tireless task of writing down everything we all say. So uh, we try to uh, be succinct whenever we can, but thorough. So um, with that, uh, we established, I established that there's a quorum. I'm going to just formally take roll. I'll let everyone know for the record who the voting members are this evening. There are always five designated voting members, uh, and uh, I will explain uh, what's required for a successful vote. Um, from the ZBA in terms of the uh, minimum vote of yes in order for an application to pass. So we'll begin now by calling a roll and members of the ZBA, please just respond in the affirmative or by saying here or I. Um, Mark Moore. Here. Stephen Delisle. Here. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Ken Swanton. Here. Bud Shannon. Here. Gregory Benick. Here. And Rob Champetti, I'm here. That's six present. Uh, we have established a quorum and can conduct our business of the ZBA based on the agenda. Uh, with that, I'll just designate again, the five voting members are going to be myself, um, uh, Mark Moore, Stephen Delisle, Ken Swanton, and uh, Walter Bud Shannon. Uh, Mr. Benick is our alternate and will step in if there's any conflict uh, or recusal along the way. I don't believe there is any, but, um, but uh, Mr. Benick will be participating in all deliberations and questions and answers, uh, and will vote on any of those matters uh, as well. So um, with that, we can open up our we've uh, we can open up our public hearing section of the um, of the ZBA meeting. Before we do, just for those that are logging on as as um, members of the public, I like to just give a lay of the land. Many uh, may already be familiar with how this works. Certainly via Zoom and in any other public hearing, there's a flow and a process. And with ZBA, we uh, we follow the rigor of that process. I start every application by reading from the agenda the. Uh, the legal notice. I read it by description, by address, uh, as well as a brief descriptor uh, of exactly what it is the applicant is seeking, whether they're seeking uh, the relief uh, of a special permit or a special permit for nonconformities or a variance, and then something that describes what specifically is being asked for, you know, um, a, um, um, a um, second floor addition or some, you know, something that puts more of of a uh, of detail into the application so that anyone who's listening who doesn't happen to have the agenda in front of them will still know essentially what's being asked of ZBA. After I read that public, uh, that public notice, we then turn the floor over to the applicant or the applicant's representatives. They'll give the presentation to the board members. Um, once they're completed, as well as any, any slides that they wish to show, all of the slides and anything that we see as members of the ZBA, uh, members of the public will also see as well Andy Port our, um, our planning director will put those placards up uh, so you'll be able to see them as we see them. Of course, all of this material is also available on the city's website. Just simply going to uh, the uh, Newbury, City of Newburyport's website, 
uh, or Googling uh, City of Newburyport Zoning Board of Appeals, you'll get a link with every single submission that we have uh, is available to the public as well for review. So after we complete the application, I'll close that portion of the public hearing. We then go to the public comment section. There's a slide which I'll ask uh, Mr. Port to put up for a moment. This slide just essentially gives the rules of the road on public comment. We invite public comment, whether for or against, uh, or in the middle or nowhere at all. Um, don't feel as though you need to speak in, in support or in opposition or come, you know, fall into any camp pro or con. Just simply raise your hand at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, we'll recognize it. I'll then open the floor by recognizing you by name. If you are calling in via phone, uh, I'll only see a telephone number, so I'll try to um, recognize you by telephone number. Um, you'll want to hit star six to unmute your mic. Is that right, Andy? Star six? Caitlin, is, is that right? Star yep, six? Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. So um, once you, um, what, you know, once uh, we recognize you, you have the floor, we do ask that you give your name and address for Ms. Joy, our, our, our note taker, uh, and then just speak your mind. Let us know what you think, pose it. If you may have questions, you're, you're welcome to frame those questions. Uh, you're welcome to frame those comments in the form of a question, but understand that we won't, as a board, be able to answer your question directly, um, but recognize that we hear your question. It's not, um, it's not any, any discourtesy toward you that we don't answer it. It's just that we operate based on a modified parliamentary procedure, sort of modified Robert's Rules of Order. So what we do is uh, we will go through this flow. We will invite you to speak your mind, of course. Uh, we ask you to keep it under two minutes out of respect for anyone else who wishes to speak. I have discretion over that and we often will go long as needed, but we just ask that everyone kindly govern themselves uh, accordingly. Um, but know well that if you ask a question, it is being heard more likely than not, you will hear your question readapted by one of the members of the ZBA during the next section of the uh, process, which, which is the uh, questions from the board section. That's when we uh, open up the, uh, the uh, application the, uh, to questions from members of the ZBA to pose questions to the applicant or the representative, their attorneys or architects. And oftentimes this is where you'll hear members of the ZBA um, who surely have taken some notes or have recalled questions that they heard in the public comment or have themselves will ask questions of the applicant or the applicant's representatives. Um, once we finish questions from each member of the ZBA, uh, I'll close that portion of the public hearing and we go to uh, deliberations. Deliberations is when members of the ZBA essentially think uh, out loud. And uh, this is where we toil over whether the applicant has met the legal criteria, the burden that they must meet in order to obtain the relief that they seek, whether there are further questions perhaps, or, or just uh, you know, whether, whether members of the ZBA um, you know, just sort of discuss fine between themselves uh, the, the presentation and the merits of the presentation. Uh, once we conclude deliberations, we will then close that portion of the public hearing. And I had mentioned earlier that we operate by a modified Rule, uh, Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, in that spirit, we then I then will ask a member of the ZBA to offer a motion to approve the application. This is the vote and final section of each and every public hearing that we have tonight. Know, know well, however, that, um, or please you know, uh, take note that a member of the ZBA making a motion to approve does not suggest that that member intends to support the application or vote to approve. It's just merely the procedural way by which the question, the motion and the application are brought forward for a full board vote. It's, in the, it's always in the affirmative in the form of a motion to approve. That motion needs to be seconded. I then will, uh, once the motion is made and seconded, I call the roll. Uh, and uh, the, um, if the application receives at least four votes in the affirmative, uh, then that applicate that motion uh, is that motion is approved or that motion carries and the application is approved. So um, that's essentially how the flow will work and we'll start with the very first application uh, after we get into two matters that are first on the agenda but that I believe the applicant seeking to um, request a continuance will take care of those and then we'll start off with our first full public hearing. So uh, with that, we have the matter of Caswell Restaurant Group, Inc., care of Lisa Mead, Mead, Tallerman, and Costa, LLC. Uh, this is the matter of 1721 State Street. It's been continued uh, from November 23rd, 2021. Uh, and uh, we have a request from, uh, the, uh, from Attorney Mead on behalf of the applicant to continue further um, this matter until March 22nd. And I understand that uh, Attorney Hallerman's here on behalf of, um, of Mead, Tallerman, and Costa. Attorney Hallerman, do you wish to be heard on this or, or may we proceed on just the request to continue? Just proceed on the, the request for continuance is fine. Very good, thank you. Um, so uh, members of the ZBA, uh, do we have a motion to continue the matter of 1721 State Street 
to our hearing of March 22nd. So moved, Mr. Moore. Great. A second that, Stephen Delisle. Thank you. Uh, motions made by Mr. Moore, seconded by Mr. Delisle on the motion to continue 1721 to March 22nd. Uh, calling the roll, Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Delisle. Yes. Mr. Swanton. Um, yes. Mr. Channon. Yes. Um, and uh, Mr. Benick. Mr. Mr. Benick, Greg. Sorry, I was on mute. Yes. Uh, no worries. And uh, Rob Champetti, I vote yes. That's six in the affirmative on the motion to continue. The motion certainly carries um, and it's continued to March 22nd. Thank you. Um, the next matter is the um, a continuation of the application by Derek Lively on behalf of 28 Liberty Street number five. The, this hearing was continued from December 14th, 2021. Uh, and is being uh, the applicants asking the ZBA to further continue this for further refinement um, to the hearing date of February 22nd, which is our next hearing later this month. Um, Mr. Lively, uh, do you wish to be heard or may we just proceed on the request? Uh, Chair, this is Caitlin. The applicant is not expected to be present tonight. Oh, great. Um, no worries. Then we will uh, just proceed on that. Do we have a motion to continue? I'll make a motion to continue 28 uh, Liberty Street number five. Um, that's application 2021-57 to February 22nd, 22 meeting. I'll second it, Ken Swanton. Thank you. Um, motion's made by Mr. Moore, seconded by Mr. Swanton on the, app, on the uh, um, motion to continue 28 Liberty Street number five. Calling the roll, Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Delisle. Yes. Mr. Swanton. Yes. Mr. Channon. Yes. Mr. Benick. Yes. Rob Champetti, I vote yes. That's six in the affirmative. Uh, the ayes have it. The motion carries and the applications continued to February 22nd. Thank you. Um, moving now to the first application uh, that we, the first full public uh, hearing. This is the application of, of Mike uh, Buchan and Anna Wallach, care of Lisa Mead, Mead, Tallerman and Costa, LLC, for the property address of 4 Plum Street. Although technically this matter was continued from uh, January 25th, 2022. I don't believe we actually ever opened the public hearing um, and took any information or evidence um, or pre presentation because uh, the applicant was seeking further review by the Historic Commission. Is that right, Caitlin? That is, thank you. Great. Uh, this is the application. The applicant seeks all necessary permits uh, to, um, this is an application for a special permit for non-conformities. The application um, the applicant seeks all necessary permits for the modification of a pre-existing non-conforming structure via construction of an addition over the existing first floor portion of the structure. May we hear from the applicant? And that's Attorney Hallerman. I, um, yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jay Tallerman of Lisa Mead gives apologies. She's unable to attend tonight, so I'm here in her stead. Um, and thank you for your patience with this matter. As you indicated, this has been twice continued without hearing because we were working with the Historical Commission. We've reached consensus with them on a plan that is significantly reduced in scope um, and is significantly more modest than the prior uh, proposal. So, um, and I don't know, I guess next uh, slide here. So existing conditions here, this is located in the R2 and DCOD district. The DCOD is not triggered. It's a very small co corner lot with primary yard on Plum Street and a secondary front yard on Elm Street. A single family structure, uh, quite old, uh, around 1800 per whatever material we could um, uh, put together. There was a bump out put on the east side of the structure that you can see in some plants we'll be showing on kind of the interior of the lot in around 1924. There are numerous uh, non-conformities, lot area, obviously, frontage, front yard setbacks, rear yard setback, maximum lot coverage, minimum open space. Um, the side yard setback and the building height, however, are conforming. Um, we are introducing no new non-conformities, so it is just um, some um, changes to the existing nonconformities. Next slide, please. So the proposed project, it, again, it, it's changed from what was originally proposed. There was a much more significant addition in that kind of back part 
tucked in where the kind of patio is. There were some dormers as well. We met with the Historic Commission um, on uh, and uh, developed a number of different changes. They've approved the current proposal, which is quite modest in nature, increases the total square footage by just 222 uh, square feet. Uh, the property has been released or the building's been released from demolition delay. So again, we're constructing a two-story addition on the rear kind of side portion of the property where presently there is only a one-story small addition bump out. Um, the proposed addition is now shorter than the existing structure. There was originally, as I mentioned, a dormer proposed and replacement of the existing roof's gable system that is no longer proposed. So apart from a proposed little 5.6-foot uh, bay window and a 16-square-foot little covered entryway with an overhang, the proposed addition is entirely within the footprint of the existing one-story bump out of the structure. Again, it's on kind of it's not along the road frontage of either of the roads. It's tucked in on the interior. Um, the, it does not intensify any existing setback nonconformities and it extends primary front yard setback only um, and just minimally, as I mentioned before. The lot coverage intensifies from 57.5% to 57.9%, where 25% is the maximum. Open space is intensified from 11% to 9%, where 40% is the minimum. Um, next slide. So here is a graphic of the existing conditions and what we're talking about, where you see kind of the, the, um, the bump out on the back of the building, which is kind of a little L shape that is the focus of the addition. Um, it is adjacent again to the paved area on the towards the rear of the property. Next slide. And this is the existing conditions. We got all four sides and a couple of photos. So you can see the single story addition. Um, the, the goal of our, our client is to increase the modest square footage of this home so that their family has a little bit more uh, living space. And although the original proposal would have increased that um, uh, amount a lot, um, the new one just does so modestly. So. Um, taking into account this uh, existing condition plan, we turn next, uh, next slide, to the proposed condition plan, where you, as you can see, really mostly what we're doing is adding a second level to the existing bump out so we can grab a little bit more square footage of um, on the second story. Again, it's uh, modest in height. It is not going up to the full height. We're not adding a third story. We're not adding dormers. There is a little um, bay window uh, on the first floor, and again, the overhang um, for the entranceway, which is shifting from kind of the back side of the structure to the side of the little bump out there. So next slide, and we could probably roll through the next slides. And by the way, we have our architect available. If, if the board has any questions um, of the architect, he is available to discuss uh, the changes that he's gone through. So again, those were we we scroll through those um, the various photos. Here's a rendering of what it looks is um, going to look like. It, it was on our first slide as well. Um, next slide. So this is an indication of where the lot is. It's obviously a very small lot. We are trying to um, uh, respect that and uh, still capture the small amount of patio space on the rear of lot. Uh, there is. Um, the, a number of the adjacent lots have uh, additions as well that have been approved over the years. Next slide. Again, uh, more photos of the property. Next. And next. So again, the criteria for a special permit for nonconformity is there's no uh, addition of no new nonconformities. There are none here. Uh, the proposed change, uh, that the proposed change will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the pre-existing nonconforming structure of use. Again, with the various uh, iterations and the improvements to the design as improved by the historical commission, 
we're essentially within the existing footprint of the existing structure apart from the little side um, bay window and the 16 foot entryway. There's a minor extension to the primary front yard setback and negligible increases to lot coverage and open space. Again, many of the neighboring structures have added small side and rear uh, L additions and we're not inconsistent with that. Um, the, we do have a number of uh, letters, I believe that are in your record that in support of this project. Uh, the project's been approved by the Historical Commission following the redesign. Um, the proposed addition continues to be subservient to the existing larger structure and fits within the surrounding neighborhood. And again, we've received those four abutter letters, which should be in your record. Um, and that, in essence, is our presentation here. I'm happy to take additional questions. All right. Uh, thank you, Attorney Hallerman. Uh, I'm sure we'll have some. Um, so with that, I'll close that portion of the public hearing. and We'll go to the public comment section. I'll just ask that the uh, public comment slide be popped up real quick. And um, anyone who wishes to speak in connection with this application, whether for or against or just uh, in the middle or nowhere at all, just simply raise your hand. I'll recognize you and we will um, we will uh, ask you to give your name and address for the record and we'll hear your comments. Looking here, I see no uh, no hands. Still no hands going once, going twice. Okay, I'll close the public comments section of the public hearing and we will go right into questions from the board. We'll begin with uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had uh, originally had questions on um, the lot coverage and open space. Um, numbers, but I think they were cleared up tonight in the in the presentation. So instead, I'll just go to uh, to ask the question just for the record. What what is the since it's a modest change and just bumping up a, a second floor on top of the existing bump out? Why uh, are there modest changes to lot coverage and open space? I could let Jeff answer that or I can uh, uh, describe it. The 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 entryway itself, even though it's just a little overhang, is adding to some of that. And we have um, the bay window um, there. Obviously, is is pushing out a, a little bit further. And I don't know if Jeff has any additional comments on uh, some of those facts and figures there. Excuse me. I can introduce myself, Jeff Alsop, Alsop Design of Hamilton. Good evening. Um, yeah, I, Jay, you did describe that correctly. The the little bay window facing the um, courtyard doesn't actually go to the ground, but because it has you know roof overhangs, um, we decided to you know include that in the in the increased coverage. And the same is really true for the little front entrance. Um, I'll just say from a, a design standpoint, we felt that that was a a you know a nice civic gest gesture in fact because the original door that you see on the on the side of Plum Street is actually going to be rendered as a, a board and batten door and will no longer be for um, public use or for visitation. Great, thanks. So so the basic basically the most of the change is because of the the covered entryway on the side. Correct. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, Mr. Delau. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Tallerman, um, I have a couple of questions uh, for you, and they relate to the uh, the chimney uh, and the um, proposed wood stove vent. Um, could you could you sort of describe that to me? Um, and was that something that was discussed at the historical commission level? I'm just curious about that. I, I'm going to again defer to Jeff on that. Sure. The chimney, I believe, is to be removed and the pipe is going to be added um, in its stead. But Jeff probably has a better focus on that. Sure, thanks. I don't know if Jeff is still with us.
Let's Hi, see. Chair. It's Caitlin. Looks like he, um, the architect, has uh, dropped off the call. Looks like. Okay, I just did get a note from him that um, those issues, uh, the chimney was not original, um, and uh, the historical commission. It was discussed at the historical commission, and they were happy uh, with or, or satisfied with the removal of that later arriving chimney and replacement with the uh, with the pipe for the the stove. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Lyle. Mr. Swanton. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, when I first saw this proposal before our last meeting, uh, before it was continued, uh, I had a lot of concerns about the massing and about what was being proposed, but I, I am so glad you worked this out with the historic commission. I think you've come up with something far better. Um, you have a nice rendering too. And I, at this point, I, I would have had a lot of questions, but now that you have revised it with them and gotten their support, I have no questions. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Swanton. Uh, Mr. Chen? Uh, Chair, I've got no questions. Uh, okay. Pretty clear cut presentation, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Benick. Um, you're muted. Uh, no questions. Thank you. Um, I, I too have to say, I. I I think this is a clear presentation. I appreciate the detail uh, as well. So I don't have any other, I don't have any questions either. Um, so if there's nothing further in the question section, we'll close that portion of the public hearing and go into deliberations. Uh, and um, I will, uh, we'll begin with uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would echo Mr. Um, Swanton's comments that um, this iteration of an addition really fits well. It, uh, it's really pleasing from a dimensional standpoint and just fitting with uh, the, the existing home as well. So I'm, I am also very happy that uh, there was a compromise and, and an approval made with the historical uh, historic commission. So um, that said, um, not that we're here to judge on how attractive it is, but it's a really it's a really good looking uh, structure addition. So. Um, that said, it's clear that the applicant has demonstrated there are no new nonconformities when we when we have to look for a special permit for nonconformities. There's no new nonconformities created. There's a slight intensification of others, um, primarily due to that overhang. Um, so when you're looking at um, looking at the size, scale, and massing to determine whether it's more substantially detrimental to the neighborhood, I don't. I can't see in any way that uh, this modest addition, the way it's been uh, designed and crafted could be substantially more detrimental. Uh, additionally, it has letters of support from a butter. So um, for those reasons, I can support this. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Delisle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm gonna concur with Mr. Moore. I think uh, this is a, a very nice looking plan and certainly uh, has benefited from the the process with the historical commission um so for the reasons mr moore stated i can also support this uh this proposal very good um mr swanton uh, i too concur with my colleagues i think they summarized it really well and uh, i can support this thank you uh mr channon yes I, I agree with uh, the previous comments um nice modest addition well done great rendering and uh, i can support it Thank you, Mr. Chan and Mr. Benick. I have nothing more to add. My colleagues have uh, uh, covered the, all the factors here that, uh, in my view, uh, make this application uh, one that uh, meets the requirements uh, that are necessary for the relief sought. Thank you, Mr. Benick. Um, I, uh... I have to say I, I agree. I think it meets the criteria. It's it's aesthetically pleasing, but also um, modest and uh, in its massing and scale, it's appropriate, uh, in my opinion. So I too can support it. Um, if there's nothing further on deliberations, we will close that portion of the public hearing and um, go into our vote. And with that, I will ask uh, if if we have a motion to approve. Uh, I will make this Mr. Moore here. I'll make a motion to approve uh, for Plum Street application 2021-59. Second, Ken Swanton. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Swanton. Motion's made and seconded. Calling the roll, Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Delisle. Yes. Mr. Swanton. Yes. Mr. Channon. Yes. And uh, is that it? Yes. 
I think Sorry, that was a yes. Yes. You said, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, yes. And uh, Rob Champetti, I vote yes. That's five in the affirmative. The ayes have it. The motion carries and the application is approved. Thank you, uh, members of the CBA. And uh, thank you uh, very much, Attorney Hallerman, for your presentation. Um, moving on to the next matter on our agenda. This is the application of Windward Shaw LLC, care of Lisa Mead, Mead, Tallerman and Costa LLC. Attorney Hallerman presenting there as well. This application is for the property address of 4446 Beacon Avenue. It is a variance request to construct a pool and pool house within the setbacks requiring dimensional variances. And with that, uh, Attorney Hallerman, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, again, for the record, Jay Tallerman uh, representing the applicant here. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. This is a, a significantly larger uh, parcel than the um, previous uh, application that you just discussed. It's located in the R2 district. It includes a single family home that is conforming to existing dimensional requirements due to the merger of two lots. Um, uh, due to its unique uh, location, it forms a corner lot on the curved portion of the road where Beacon Ave and South uh, Pond Street connect. The merged lot has three side yards due to the curved front yard and the inverted side yard boundaries. Next slide. So this was uh, two lots created by the city by a subdivision in the city in 1957. They were conveyed out together in 57. They were um, briefly held in uh, separate ownership, but they've been held in common ownership since 1960. Uh, the current applicant did not create the lot configuration. Next slide. So the, the proposal here, the, the house is being constructed or just finished uh, being constructed now, again, completely conforming um, structure. The uh, proposal is to construct a swimming pool within the front and side yard setback requirements, along with a pool house adjacent to that uh, within the front and side yard setback requirements. No work is proposed uh, for the specific uh, single family home. As to the variances in particular, uh, front yard setback 25 feet is required where the pool will be eight feet from the front boundary. Side yard setback six feet required where pool is 5.5 feet from the side yard boundary. For the pool house itself, um, it's greater than uh, 22 by 24 in footprint, which means the R2 district's 10 foot requirement for side yard setback applies rather than the six foot requirement for accessory structures. So a front yard setback 25 feet is required where the pool house will be 11 and a half feet from the front boundary. As to side yard setbacks, 10 feet is required where the pool house is 6.2 and 6.4 feet from the side yard boundaries. No other uh, new non-conformities are created. Next slide. So here's a little bit of a, a depiction of what we're trying to do. We'll get into um, some more pictures. You can see um, on the right side of our plan is where the main house is. You could get a feel for the unique uh, shape of this particular lot along the curved street line. The blue piece is obviously our swimming pool and the piece behind it towards the top of the plan is the pool house. Next slide. This is a, a small rendering of the pool house. Um, rather than have just patio area there with uh, open equ equipment, we thought it would be a nice touch of a small pool house. It has a small overhang to the left side and the inside has a little bit of amenities all, all enclosed there. Uh, next slide. So here, this shows a little bit of what we uh, have in mind. It, it helps here because landscaping I think is important on this site. Um, we have heard uh, from our neighbors as we'll get into in a little bit and uh, they have expressed an interest in retaining the landscaping along the street there. We are 100% uh, retaining the street trees that are over there even though they're all um, are on our property. We respect that and our proposal includes retaining those. Along that street boundary, it's shaded in brown, is going to be a six foot high cedar stockade fence. It fits neatly under the tree canopy and makes essentially the pool invisible. 
Behind the pool house, there's an existing fence that's in somewhat of disrepair. We're going to be removing that and replacing it uh, with the matching cedar uh, fence. So it will shield from that property um, the uh, proposal um, significantly. Um, again, here's some, there's some more landscaping details here, but the, the key components of it are that fencing and the retention of those two trees in proximity to the two new items here, the pool and the pool house. Um, next slide. So again, um, a repeat picture of uh, the pool house. We can uh, go to the next slide. So this shows you kind of the unique uh, situation of our, of our um, lot. It's not only unique in shape generally, it's unique in with respect to other area lots, um, which is a significant component of the uniqueness criteria. And it gives you a feel for the orientation and where it's uh, located. Next slide. Right, so as to the variance itself, again, this is a, a unique lot. It's a corner lot with a curved front yard. Um, but for this being a corner lot, the portion of the front yard where the proposed construction is to occur would be a side yard and the applicant would have more opportunities to fit its uh, proposal in a more compliant manner. Um, in, in that regard, I believe that this board has had an opportunity to consider corner lots and the relationship of pools that would normally be in the side or a rear yard being in that particular area of the lot. The rear and side boundaries are highly unusual. Five total boundaries instead of four. There's that odd node in the northwest corner of the lot where the pool house is proposed that is cut off and, and then moves inwardly. Um, uh, there are existing trees near the boundaries in front of the property that provide screening. We've spoken to the neighbors across the street and to each side. They all prefer that we keep those trees. We agree. We think with the retention of those trees and the construction of a, of a modest, attractive fence will contribute to the aesthetic of the neighborhood. Um, we, we have met with them. The letters from those neighbors, I believe, were submitted and are available for the board uh, to review. Um, if the pool or the pool house were proposed anywhere else on the property would likely require removal of trees. Uh, there is a possibility that we could um, uh, develop uh, a pool or put in a pool in an area that would be more conforming, but it would require removal of trees. Again, we didn't create this current lot shape and when we, as, as we go into hardship criteria, these lots were conveyed and held in common ownership previously. Um, they were, have been held in common ownership since 1960. The house that was constructed on it is in relative scale with the surrounding houses. There's some other very large houses in this neighborhood. The house is conforming um, and received all approvals for that. We don't believe we derogate from the intent and uh, purpose of the zoning ordinance in that the proposed locations are located as far away from the boundaries as possible, given their modest size, and they are um, screened substantially by the retention of the trees and the installation of the fence. All of that information has been shared with our neighbors. We've had a number of conversations with them. And again, you have the letters of support from the neighbors across the street and to each side. Um, the immediate abutting properties, there are um, uh, no structures close to the boundaries near the location of the proposed construction. The portion of the abutting lots closest to the proposal are undeveloped with some natural screening from the existing trees. Um, and uh, no special privilege is granted to the applicant as other structures in the neighbors in the neighborhood have some non-conforming setbacks as well. We don't have those with respect to the visible structures, but with respect to the structures that will be hidden by the um, fencing, um, there, um, uh, there are some non-conformities, obviously. Uh, next slide. So again, this is a, a picture uh, from of the with an excerpt from the uh, GIS. It shows the location of the properties that have lent their support to this. 
again, the properties you know, on sharing our two side borders, um, so to speak, and the property directly across the street um, that would face um, the site that is most visible or the portion of the site that's most visible um, containing the pool. So we have letters of support from all of them. And I believe that um, is, concludes the presentation and I'm happy to take any questions or comments that the board or the public has. Okay, um, thank you, Attorney Tallerman. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll circle back with questions um, sure. as we have them. So uh, we'll close that portion of the public hearing and go to public comment. Um, anyone who is uh, attending the ZBA hearing, uh, public comment, we have a uh, we have a, an instruction placard that's up right now that just gives uh, the rules of the road and I'll just recognize any hands who may wish to speak. Then we just ask you to give your name and address for the record. Seeing no hands, uh, going once, going twice. Um, okay, I will close the public comment section and we will move right into questions from the board. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Moore. Thank you, Chairman Champetti. Uh, that's a good slide to have up because uh, the first question I have is um, the discussion of um, the node over where the the pool house is, is going to be. And by node, are you referring to basically the right angle that that the the left side of that red um, boundary? Yeah. The, and it and it and it cuts in sharply at basically a ninety degree angle. Is that is that the, the node you discuss? Correct. Okay. Um, Given, I mean, I don't think, I mean, I certainly can see how uniquely shaped uh, this lot is. It's it's pretty, it should be obvious that it's a uniquely shaped lot and, and um, it's certainly worthy of various discussion, especially with the, the pool on the side versus a front setback situation. I do, however, have a question on the on the pool with, we're looking for um, a variance and then you have the pool house and building a pool house at such a size that it that it, it can't honor the 10 foot setbacks and I, I wondered um, if there was ever a thought not to impinge on either of those setbacks when it would be pretty easy to, to place one there and you wouldn't be looking for or looking to encroach on those setbacks so I would say with respect to the pool house itself um, I think if you look at, yes, this slide that's right there, mm -hmm. virtually any pool house that we have, um, unless it was incredibly small in size, um, there's like a little triangle right in the middle of it. So our window to um, not uh, be within setbacks is very slim. Okay. Again, we considered whether to do a pool house at all and ultimately decided to do it, felt there would be more privacy for the neighbors if we contained some of that rather than having patio area back there that would perhaps create more noise. Um, it's completely shielded from that area of the property. Um, we've thought of, um, the, again, part of that pool house is just an overhang. We've gone through a number of iterations and you know, we're willing to consider other iterations too we tried to make something that fit within the that particular oddball portion of the property right. while not being adverse to the neighbor adjacent to it. There is a fence there. So those a lot, lot of considerations went into it. We feel there's actually more privacy with the structure than without a um, structure as, a, um, as it applies to impacts to that most adjacent neighbor. Okay, uh, thank you. I have no further questions right now. All right, thank you, Mr. Delisle. Any questions? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Attorney Tellerman, just sort of picking up on Mr. Moore's thought, um, if you if the pool house drops from, what, what, what is it? It's 36 by 15. If you were to go to a 22 by 24, then you could be in the, you could avail yourself of the six foot setback, right? I, I think there's a, you know, I'm not the um, designer. Um, I think he may actually, the uh, builder may be on the call, um, uh, Mr. Hazeltine, but um, the, um, yes, I think if the square footage did reduce, we could potentially open up a little more marginally available area for the setbacks here. That is true. 
I, and, you know, and so I see, yeah. I, if I can just interrupt for a second, I do see um, Mr. Hazeltine's um, hand up so we can, if, um, if George wishes sure. to speak, we can just, yeah. I think, and I think we just have to promote him to the panel and, un, and unmute your mic and Mr. Hazeltine, you have the floor. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, thank you, Mr. Champetti. Uh, we did, uh, Mr. Delisle, we uh, and Mr. Moore, we did uh, go through significant consideration with respect to the size of the pool house and and also uh, consideration of the privacy from the neighbor adjacent to us in making it, you know, just uh, big enough to encapsulate, you know, uh, you know, kind of the indoor space that uh, or you know patio slash kitchen space that they were looking for, rather than having it outside. Um, and it was really, um, a byproduct of moving everything around to try and, uh, preserve the trees, um, that this, uh, came about and, uh, just based on the feedback that, uh, you know, I reviewed with everyone, this seemed to be the best, uh, solution to capture the intent as well as, uh, enhance their, um, privacy of the neighborhood. I hope that answers your question. It, it does. It, it, it leads me to another question though. Um, Whereas the the structure could be smaller and you could get the same or a similar use uh, from the structure at a at a smaller size, is that is that a reasonable it, statement? It, you know, if it is the will of the board that that they're you know certainly want us to to look at that and try and make that smaller, certainly can 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 work through that process. We did run a couple iterations of just flow inside it and. Um, you know, achieving, you know, the, the fact that we, they wanted the privacy inside uh, with the space that was allowed. This was really the smallest we could make it because they remember the covered seating area isn't uh, enclosed and I get it, it, it does have a roof on it. Um, but uh, uh, that's, that's what we came up with. But of course, you know, if, if, if it is the will of the, the board that, that that's something they need to see, that's certainly something we can try and, uh, and work on. Thank you, Mr. Hazeltine. Uh, I don't have any questions with regard to the pool, so uh, I will uh, uh, yield the rest of my time here. All right. Thank you, Mr. Delisle. Uh, we'll go to uh, Mr. Swanton. Uh, thank you. Um, so I walk by this place uh, frequently. I've been noticing the house going up. It's a, kind of an amazing house. Uh, you've done a nice job there. Um, my first question is, how big is this house? What is the square footage of this house? Because it's hard to tell from these diagrams, it's, and it's, it's it's approximately 3,600 square feet. Okay, so it looked big. So that's that is a good size house. Um, you know, following up on what my two colleagues have just talked about, I mean, we have seen over the last several years <clears throat> several people like this who have been on corners, who can't really put the pool in the backyard because it winds up being a front yard, and we have allowed it. Uh, and you know, with pools, people have to put up fences and most people put up even higher ones than you need to with a pool. And so the pool kind of disappears and it's, even though it's, you know, it's, it's in the front yard, it kind of disappears. But this pool structure that you mentioned once was a small pool house at 36 feet long. You, you got to appreciate some of the buildings we look at on the board here aren't 36 feet long. I mean, that's a that's a big structure. I realize some of that roof is over a patio area, but that's a very long roof. Um, I don't really have a question because I think my two previous uh, colleagues have already kind of probed it, but this is not something we're used to seeing uh, and it's very large. Uh, I realize the house is very big, so in this drawing, it may look smaller than it might otherwise, which is why I asked the question of how large is the house. Anyway, so I, I, I just want to echo some of the concerns that I've heard and yield the rest of my time. Very good. Um, we'll uh, move to uh, Mr. Channon. Thank you, Chair. Um, some of my questions have been answered, but I do have one left. Um, I couldn't find on the, on the drawings, uh, how big is the pool? The pool looks like it's bigger than the pool house. Do you, do you have the dimensions of the pool? Um, I'll, I'll let Mr. Uh, Attorney Tallerman answer that, but it's a very modest size, but go ahead. Yeah, it's, hold on, I'm trying to get, I have a separate plan. I'm trying to um, access it here. Hold on one sec and give you two. It, 
it isn't as big as it seems. It's a, um, obviously a somewhat unique shape. Um, it is roughly in its, in its width, um, the, the back side of it or the, the, the main width of it is roughly about 15 feet wide. Um, it is roughly about 32 feet long. And the little bump outs on each side, one is about eight by 10 and the other one's about eight by seven. Those are, that's, that's rough numbers based on kind of a, a, a rough plan that I have drawn. It, it's probably slightly different than that, but roughly 15 by 30 or so with a two little bump outs. Okay, thank you. So it's, it's, uh, it's modestly large. It, and it's it's very similar in size to the um, to the pool house. I have no other questions, Chair. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chen and, and um, uh, Mr. Benick. Uh, well, I don't have any questions, but I guess I have some observations. Uh, I can say them now or later. I'll just... No, no, you can you can feel free to see them now. I mean, yeah, see them. I'll, I'll just get them off my chest at the moment. Uh, so number one, this is a tasteful proposal in the abstract, it's quite tasteful. And uh, if I were building a swimming pool and a bathhouse, I think I would uh, use this uh, as a model. I like it a lot. Uh, second, uh, this lot certainly is unique in terms of its uh, shape. So uh, as one of my colleagues said, this certainly uh, invites us to have the dialogue regarding whether or not the requirements for a variance are met. Uh, so then I guess the next question is, uh, would the denial of this proposal constitute a uh, uh, substantial hardship? And I guess my view of that uh, certainly is that it certainly pushes the envelope. Uh, I don't think that uh, the applicant here would su suffer a substantial hardship if the applicant doesn't have a pool and pool house along these lines as set forth in this application. Uh, so, uh, and I'll take my colleagues' observations regarding the size of both the pool and the, and the uh, pool house to support uh, my uh, unease about whether or not this denial of this would constitute a uh, substantial hardship. So those are my observations. I'm not voting on this, but uh, uh, as I say, this certainly presses the envelope uh, on, on, um, on the uh, issues and concerns regarding whether uh, the rigorous requirements for a variance are met here. Okay, thank you, Mr. Benick. Um, I, uh, I don't have any additional questions that haven't already been asked and answered. Uh, I feel anyway, uh, so we can. Uh, Hi, Chair. It's Caitlin. If you wouldn't mind for a moment. Sure. Um, I wanted to bring your attention to the proposed fence um, here, and I'd like to um, see if Jennifer wouldn't mind commenting on the height. Um, I believe um, they would be allowed a maximum of four feet, and this says I believe six feet. Yes. Uh, it, this is Jennifer Blanchet. It the. Uh, statement tonight that there would be a six foot fence along the street was the first that uh, I believe the that that was brought to our attention and I there the Newburyport zoning ordinance does state that the maximum fence height within a front yard is four feet uh, without a variance you are before the board for a variance so if it is your intention to uh, construct a six foot fence uh, perhaps that could be added to the variance at this juncture, uh, or perhaps that was just an error uh, or some, somehow an annotation got changed on the plan and only a four foot fence was in fact proposed. Uh, either way, I would hope that that could be clarified for the record. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Blanchet for that comment. Um, let's see, Attorney Tallerman, do, do, uh, do you wish to address that comment regarding the fence before we before we close out this section and go into our next segment. Yeah, and 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 I'll offer a broader comment as, as well, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, the six foot fence is ideal. We will revisit um, the uh, fence issue and 
whether or not we need to amend the application to include that as a variance, um, which would it, it would provide a little bit more privacy for the neighbors or reduce to a four foot. I also take heed of the comments by the board members. Um, they're all astute. Um, and whether it be by removal of the covered area or a, an, another modification to the pool house, as Mr. Hazel, Hazeltine said, I think we're willing to consider and um, resharpen our pencils and go over that. We heard some comments regarding the shape or the size of the pool as well. Um, we'll take a look at that. It'll be substantially screened from view, but we take all comments seriously. Um, we have reviewed your past variances for variances for pools on corner lots, um, and we'll take those into consideration as well when we're looking at this. So I think what we um, would like to request is that we continue this matter rather than conclude it and deliberate tonight so that we can, again, sharpen our pencils and come up with something that um, uh, meets uh, closer to the board's or addresses the board's concerns here. Um, okay, uh, Attorney Tallerman, if I'm hearing you correctly, you'd like the board to undertake a uh, continuance um, request. How much time were you thinking? Um, I'd, I'd uh, rely on George uh, for that. And I know it's my understanding that the board is trying to limit the number of agenda items that they have. Uh, we can be ready um, by your next meeting if it needs to push to March uh, 22nd, we could do that as well. But George has indicated to me that he could have um, some new plans as well as the fence issue addressed um, uh, by um, uh, the next meeting. Um, Caitlin, what's, um, what, what does the docket look like for the next, say, three meetings? Um, it looks like for February 22nd, there are two minor modifications and then one um, continued public hearing. So I would, I think there'd be room for this, that you'd have two public hearings on that night. Right. Very good. Then uh, that's, that's, that makes sense then. Um, okay. Great. So then it would be February 22nd would be the next available slot without. Great. Okay. So um, if you uh, bear with us for a moment, Attorney Tallerman, we'll just go through um, the motion and the vote and get that squared away. Um, all right, so members of the CBA, do we have a motion uh, upon the applicant's request to continue the application uh, to allow them further time for refinement to the hearing date, our next hearing date of February 22nd? So moved, Mr. Moore. Second, Ken Swanton. Motions made by Mr. Moore and seconded by Mr. Swanton. Thank you. I'm calling the roll on the, the request for continuance, Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Delisle. Yes. Mr. Swanton. Yes. Mr. Shannon. Yes. And Mr. Benick? Um, did we lose You're Mr. Muted. Benick? You're muted. <laughs> All right. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, and um, Rob Champetti, I vote yes. That is um, six in the affirmative on the motion to continue. The ayes have it. The motion carries. Will uh, Attorney Tallerman, we'll see you and Mr. Hazeltine back on the 22nd. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good. All right. Moving to um, the next application. Uh, this is an application for a special permit for non, actually is it a special permit for non-conformities? Bear with me a sec. <coughs> uh, yes, a, a special permit for non-conformities. Uh, the applicant um, is uh, represented by Andrew, or Andrew Sidford, um, uh, Andrew Sidford Architects on behalf of one Atkinson Street. The applicant seeks to re uh, request all necessary permits um, to request a rear and side yard setback release. The proposed work fills out the second floor over the existing first floor at the rear of the structure. And the addition would be approximately six feet by 15 feet or 90 square feet in total. The proposed construction does not change the footprint uh, of the house nor, uh, nor uh, the lot coverage, but extends um, the existing nonconformities. Uh, with that, may we hear from the applicant, Mr. Sidford. Um, hello. Uh... Mr. Chairman and members of the board, my name is Andrew Sidford. I'm an architect here in Newburyport, and I'm representing uh, Kathy Murphy and Tom Anderson. And the first slide uh, is shows the site plan. It is the property is at one Atkinson Street. Um, it's very similar to the application you heard two applications ago. And 
for reference, this house is slightly larger than the pool house that you just reviewed. So it's a, it's a very, very tiny lot. And uh, this slide shows that on this uh, street, there are uh, very large houses and, and, and uh, multi-unit houses around a very tight neighborhood. Can we have the next slide, please? These are pictures uh, of the existing house. Uh, in the upper left shows uh, the, street the street elevation. The entrance is on the side on the left there. On the upper right is the rear of the existing house. And it shows the, the, it shows the small uh, one-story rear portion of the house that we're proposing adding on above. And you can see the gable above that, which is the shape that the addition would, would take. So it's essentially a, a modest extrusion of the original roof form. On the lower left shows a blow up of the front ele elevation showing the entryway. And um, on the lower right shows the front elevation with the side, uh, uh, the right side of the house. The next slide, please. The proposed work, uh, this, by the way, this project has been reviewed and approved by the Historic Commission as well. This just shows some of uh, some additional photos of the neighborhood and, and the tight nature of it and neighboring houses and street. Next slide, please. Uh, this this shows the the, the zoning uh, chart and you know given the small lot size, there are a number of nonconformities, but the, but the key is we are not changing the footprint. We are not we're not uh, adding, creating any new nonconformities. We are uh, simply uh, proposing to build up over the, the rear of, of the house. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows a site plan. And what you see in, in red is simply where the, the setbacks of the site extend into the house. And uh, that's the, the solid red line. And the dotted red line back to the word shed shows that is actually the extent of the addition proposed. So as I said, very modest addition. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is just a blow up without, the other slide showed the neighboring houses, how close they are. This is a little bit clearer to show the setbacks. And again, the dotted red line towards the left of the drawing is the proposed addition. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are the uh, existing elevations of the house drawn in two dimensions. This is, on the left is the front of the house. On the back shows the existing shed at the first floor that we already mentioned in the, in the photograph would be extended above that. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the side elevation. And uh, again, this illustrates on the upper left, you can see the portion that we're proposed. That's where the house we're, we're proposing just extending that on all the way to the back of the first floor. Next slide, please. This is the other side of the house. And it also shows that existing first floor shed uh, from the other side. Next slide, please. Just a section through, there's a, there's a, a new stairway proposed, but not a zoning issue. Next slide, please. And these are the proposed elevations. Uh, on the left, that is the front of the house with no changes. On the back of the house, it shows the new addition extending over the first floor and some new windows. Again, all of which have been viewed by the Historic Commission and approved. Next slide, please. And this is the side elevation that shows the new windows. And again, the dotted line shows the original outline of the house and the, uh, the extension of the addition proposed on the second floor over the footprint of the first floor. Next slide, please. Again, the other side, um, extending, you can see the, their, the height of the house is small. We're not making any, any taller. We're just taking that same roof form back. Next slide. Again, the section showing a <laughs> code conforming a stair, just to extend of construction. Next slide. That's the end of the presentation. Great, that's, that's all I have. I'm, I'm happy to entertain questions. Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Sitford. We'll uh, circle back with some questions uh, and we'll just close that portion 
of the public hearing for now and go to public comment. Um, I, uh, I ask uh, anyone who wishes to speak, just take a quick look at our um, instructions for public comment. Uh, feel free to just click the raise your hand button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and we will recognize you. And please just give your name and address for the record. Um, I see uh, the hand of Mason Mitchell Daniels. And uh, uh, so I will go ahead and recognize Mason, Mason Mitchell Daniels. Uh, you can just unmute your mic and you have the floor. Hi, um, my name is Mason Mitchell Daniels, and I am an abutter. I own the property at 28 Strong Street. So the new addition basically looks into my backyard. So I really, I'm not sure that I have any objections, but I came tonight um, because I got the letter in the mail. This is my first um, time at one of these. And I wanted to know a bit more about the plans because it is a tight space. Um, and I do have, I just had one question on one of the last pictures that had been shown. Um, there's like a shed outside of the actual non-conforming space. And I couldn't tell from one of the pictures if the, if it was actually going out to the end of the shed or if it was actually to the, the building um, space. So, um, one of my other questions was sort of about the space because it's so tight, like how many windows, because currently there's just one very small window um, out the back. So anyway, I it's a very tight space to work in. So I don't really want to be you know, a roadblock, but just as a neighbor, I came to find out more. OK, well, thank you. Uh... Ms. Mitchell Daniels, and um, if you hadn't, um, in, unless you were otherwise aware, since this is your first meeting, I'll, I'll just share with you. Oftentimes during the public comment section, um, I just wanted to let you know, you, you may not hear a direct response to your question, but, but please know that it's uh, no discourtesy intended to any member of the public. We just take in all of those questions during the section, and uh, very, um, very surely you would be hearing um, you know, uh, the subject matter of anything you may have raised or anyone may have raised in the uh, in the section of our hearing when the uh, when the board members themselves ask questions, but um, but I just wanted to let you know in case you weren't here during the initial part of the hearing. That's fine, thank you. And uh, thank you very much for your comments. Um, anyone else wish to speak? Um, going once, going twice, seeing no hands. Um, you know what I'll do since there was only one comment and since it's fresh in our minds, uh, Mr. Sitford, you hearing those comments. Um, I'm going to give you an opportunity, if you could, to just address them for the board members, and it'll probably just uh, spare us the, you know, asking you the very same question in a few minutes. Sure. Can we go back one more slide? I think we'll show it. Oh, sorry, one more. If the, if we can show one that shows the proposed addition, it's hard for me to see the small images. Was one of the yeah one more shows yeah there it is, so uh, good question. There is a, a a single story some sort of enclosure on the back that's temporary that will be removed. The addition uh, uh, the additional space doesn't e extend past the the rear of the first floor of the house, and you'll see the windows uh, actually in the design process we looked at an addition in the yard but it's so, it's so small. The, the, this proposed um, extension above the first floor is to get a little bit more room for a bedroom. And the windows are primarily uh, very similar to before where we have, have added most windows are, are where the first floor looks into their own yard. And so it's primarily, there are some new windows in the, and, and a bedroom on the second floor, but most of the new windows are down on the first floor where the kitchen looks into a side yard and, and a rear yard. So I hope that answers the question. We will not be extending past the footprint of the original house. And there is a freestanding shed that will be removed. All right, very good. Um, any other questions uh, from the public? Any other, anyone else wish to speak in connection with the application? Uh, going once, seeing no hands still, going twice. I will close that portion of the public hearing and we will move to questions from the board. And we'll begin with uh, Mark Moore, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, but unfortunately, you stole my long hanging fruit uh, <laughs> by having that explained. So uh, I don't have any further questions at this time. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, next, uh, we'll see if Mr. Delisle has any questions. I'm afraid I don't have any questions either. All right. Thank you, Mr. Delisle. Mr. Swanton. Uh, I did enjoy, I wanted to make a comment. I did enjoy your uh, uh, comment about the relative size relative to the pool house. I enjoy a little humor. Um, but no, I don't have any other questions. I thought it was very clear. I'm familiar with the neighborhood and it's a very clear presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swanton. Mr. Channon? Uh, I, I have to say I agreed that I, I enjoyed that comment as well. I, I think this house, other than it being two stories, is very close to the pool house that we just uh, were looking at. It's, it's really close. It's, uh, it's within a few feet. Uh, but I have no other questions. Thank you. All right. And uh, Mr. Benick? I have no questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Benick. I, I too have no further questions that haven't been addressed. So we will, uh, if there's nothing else, we'll close that portion of the public hearing and go into um, deliberations. Um, and again, we're deliberating the criteria for a special permit for nonconformities. Uh, we'll begin with uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I think we've all already mentioned and noticed, uh, this is a, a very modest proposal to a house that needed to have a modest proposal uh, to make this work from a sense of size, scale, and massing. So I'll go backwards on the on the two hurdles. So um, I, I don't see extending this up um, from the existing bump out uh, to be um, much more substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood as, as opposed to what's there already. And since they're creating no new nonconformities, I can support this. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Mr. Delisle? Yep, I would agree with Mr. Moore once again. Um, the squaring off of, of the structure really doesn't create a situation that would be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, uh, and I think that, you know, Mr. Mr. Sinford uh, explained well, I, I think, to, uh, to answer the question raised by um, the abutter. So uh, there being no Nonconformity, uh, excuse me, no new nonconformity as well. I can, uh, I can support this project. All right, thank you, Mr. Delisle and uh, Mr. Swanton. Uh, I concur with my colleagues. I think they said it very well. I can support this. And uh, thank you, Mr. Shannon. Yeah, I, I agree with the previous statements. I can support the application. And uh, Mr. Benick, uh, what say you? Uh, I echo the observations of my colleagues. All right, thank you, Mr. Benick. I I, um, I agree, and uh, it appears you know the applicant certainly a modest request. The applicant does appear to have satisfied both prongs of the criteria under nine B two that we as a board are charged with um, with reviewing. Um, first, it appears that they um, that the um, uh, that there's no addition of a new nonconformity by this proposal, and that there's no. Um, um, and that there is uh, that the proposed alteration is not substantially more detrimental than existing conditions or um, or the um, the existing um, the existing neighborhood in terms of size, scale, and massing. So I believe uh, that those are the legal criteria that needed to be met. I, I feel like we've all said this one way or the other. Um, I, I echo it, so um, I too can support it. Um, also, I'll note that it, the application does not appear to trigger the um, the tree and sidewalk ordinance, and that's also in our staff report. Um, so it's not incumbent upon us to add any additional conditions on sidewalk or street trees. So uh, with that, and if there's nothing else, I'll close deliberations and um, ask um, a member of the ZBA for a motion to approve. So more here, I'll make a motion to approve um, the special permit for nonconformities application for one Atkinson Street that's uh, ZNC 22-1. Second, Ken Swanton. All right, motions made by Mr. Moore and seconded by Mr. Swanton, calling the roll. Uh, Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Delisle? Yes. Mr. Swanton? Yes. Mr. Channon? Yes. Rob Champetti? Um, I vote yes. That's five in the affirmative. The ayes have it. Motion carries and the application for special permit for nonconformities is approved. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sidford, and uh, good luck to you, uh, you and your clients. Thank you. Thank you, board. Have a good have night. Good night. All right, moving on to the next application before us. Uh, this is the application of Laura McLaughlin and Stephen Quish, Jr., care of Lisa Mead, Mead Tallerman, and Costa LLC, um, uh, represented by attorney Jay Tallerman on behalf of uh, Mead Tallerman and Costa. The application address is 303 High Street. Uh, and this is a special permit for nonconformities request um, to construct an addition to the back portion of a single family structure 
which will extend the existing and existing nonconformity. With that, uh, Attorney Tellerman, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, okay, terrific. So the, again, 303 High Street, Newburyport, a special permit for nonconformities uh, with the rendering on this first page, and we'll get back to that. Next slide. So this is located in the HSRB and DCOD district. The DCOD is not triggered. It's a corner lot with a primary front yard on North Atkinson and a secondary front yard on High Street. It's a single family structure constructed in and around 1875. It has a number of existing nonconformities. Lot area is only 4,700 feet where 30,000 required front yard setbacks. Um, are pretty significantly reduced. We have roughly 5.2 feet and secondary front yard of 24.6 where 30 feet is required. Rear yard setback, 50 feet is required where um, it is 13 feet. Maximum lot coverage of 15% where the lot has 22.8%. Minimum open space of 70% and there is only 61.7 here. The frontage, um, the side yard setback in the building height are conforming. Next slide. So the proposed project um, has gone through again, um, a number of iterations on our side. We've worked with the historic commission and they have approved the proposal that is before you and released it from demolition delay. There's a lot of details in those discussions and I'll try and touch on that a little bit as we go through. Essentially, there is an addition um, on the kind of main part of the house, and this uh, two-story addition is essentially going to be uh, where that one is. There are some additional considerations there. There's a bay window bump out, um, and there's also a one-story portion attached to the new two-story section. The proposed addition extends the primary front yard um, setback and intensifies the rear yard setback from 13.3 to 11.3, where 50 feet are required. Uh, lot coverage is intensified from 22.8% to 27.2%, um, and the open space in, is intensified from 61.7 to 59.5. Uh, uh, again, where 40% is the minimum. Next slide. So this um, slide essentially shows you the uh, structure and where the uh, addition is going to be located. The main portion of the house will be um, untouched and it's the rear portion that is um, the lesser portion of the structure that is going to go through some changes. Uh, next slide. So the next uh, four slides are the existing uh, conditions of the um, house as it exists right now. Uh, the front here, next slide. One of the two sides, uh, next slide. Again, this is the, the rear, uh, so to speak, of the home uh, where a lot of the action is going to be. As you can see, it's rough. It's a, a one-story addition to the home now, and it will be increasing. Next slide. There's a roadside side uh, of the structure where there was a significant amount of discussion regarding some of the details, windows, et cetera, with the historical commission. And you'll see ultimately where we've been very true to the existing design of some of those elements. Next slide. So these next four slides um, go through the changes in that you're going to be seeing from all four sides of the home. The left side of the building here, you have a small visibility of the bump out. Uh, next slide. So here you see the scope of the uh, second story addition it doesn't go up to the full roof height, so it's still staying subsidiary. We are keeping true to the window design, carrying it up uh, to the upper portion, and we're adding a little bit of that one story for the entryway on the rear. Next slide. Um, gives you a feel for how it will look from the back. Again, we're not really increasing except for that uh, bump out. Um, the, the scope of it looking in this direction is not really getting any wider than it currently exists. Next slide. 
And again, this side of the building, we are keeping that first floor where that uh, window is. There was some um, uh, discussion about that. We're carrying the design of the windows that are um, going to be visible again from the road there up to the second story and trying to keep the scale and the design similar to what already exists there. Uh, next slide. Some photos of the, of the existing structure. Next. As you can see, there's a significant amount of vegetation already there in that uh, part of the neighborhood. Um, next slide. Uh, this is the side that'll be most visible and it's what, where it shows our, um, our, our rendering um, bears that out. Next slide. Next. And this is the side where the additional largely be visible coming from that direction. Next slide. Another view from another angle. Next. And a couple renderings here from a, a couple of different angles. This was on, the, on our cover page as you're approaching from the kind of front corner of the home, um, the kind of modest nature and how that addition fits in with the existing architecture of the home. Next slide. And again, looking at it coming from the other direction, so you get a sense of the scale. Um, it's essentially adding, again, that little entryway and the second story on what already exists there for a, a bit more uh, living area. Next slide. Uh, it gives you a picture of the, of the property from above and, and its uh, location, which most of you are very familiar with. Next. So the, and the, the criteria for a special permit, again, there'll be no, that there be no addition of new nonconformities. We are uh, increasing modestly some of the existing nonconformities, but there are no new nonconformities created. Second, that the proposed change will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the pre-existing nonconforming uh, structure. The addition is uh, modest and to the rear kind of interior portion of the structure. We're not continuing any of the sidelines and going to the full width of the uh, larger structure. The addition remains subservient to the existing home. And apart from the proposed bay window, the proposal is entirely stepped in from the existing main portion of the home. Uh, the home aesthetically faces High Street uh, from which the addition will be minimally viewable. Um, extension of the nonconformities are minor on what is an undersized lot in the HSRB district. The lot's only 4,700 square feet and 45 feet wide, uh, where there's a corner lot where the required setbacks are 30 feet on the front side and 50 on the rear side. Uh, most importantly, um, the Historical Commission has approved the proposal. Um, we believe it's compatible with the very historic homes in the surrounding neighborhood and not substantially more detrimental um, than the existing structure. I believe that it uh, concludes our uh, presentation here. All right. Thank you, Attorney Tallerman. And um, with that, uh, we will close that portion of the public hearing and go into public comment. Anyone who wishes to speak in connection with this application, uh, just kindly raise your hand and we will recognize you. If you can click the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, I'll recognize you and you can just give your name and your address and speak your mind. Seeing no hands at the moment, give it another moment, going once, going twice. Okay, um, for now I'll close the uh, public comment portion of the public hearing and we'll go right into questions from the board, uh, beginning with um, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Chairman Trumpetti. Um, well, originally I was concerned um, with uh, the 19% lot coverage uh, increase. But one thing that was very helpful, uh, and, and again, given this is an, an undersized lot, but uh, for the area, um, but one thing that was helpful to me were the, uh, the renderings that were added in um, this, and this angle and the other especially. So um, I think the presentation was pretty straightforward and I don't have any questions. All right, Mr. Moore, um, we'll go to Mr. DeWile. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
yeah, the the lot coverage was the thing that kind of caught my eye too. And um, uh, Attorney Towerman, I guess the thing that I was I was concerned about is that you know you're going up to twenty seven point two percent, and that that's sort of a big um, a big number, I guess. Um, so if you could just sort of speak to that a little bit. I think the, 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 lot, the lot coverage, and by the way, I also wanted to mention that there are, I believe it's in your files, there are three letters of support that should be in your record. The, the, the lot coverage increase, um, while it is a 5% increase, it's attributable to that kind of bump, small bump out area, and then that rear kind of entry vestibule kind of mudroom area. So the, yes, the lot coverage does increase, but uh, we, we think it is increasing um, with the most modest components of the uh, addition here. So we're not asking, so the lot coverage, if we took away what is essentially a small mudroom, we're not asking that that portion go up to the second story. We are keeping it uh, modest in scale. And I think it, it contributes pretty substantially to the increase in the lot coverage, but we tried to do it in the most modest way possible. The, the two-story addition is really not, with the exception of the small bump out, is not really increasing the lot coverage at all. It is more just going straight up. I mean, not exactly, but it is um, more, um, again, just the addition of second floor space. Okay. Um... Yep. Okay. That works for me. Um, I have no further questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Lyle. Mr. Swanton. Um, I'm trying to get a sense of how big this expansion is. Uh, according to the property record card, this uh, house currently has 1,478 square feet of living space. So, I, so I, my first question is, is that what it currently has, 1,478? And how much does this addition add? I'm looking. I'm. I'm looking for those numbers right now. Um, on the total square footage um, addition here, I am um, in the materials that I have. I know I've seen those numbers. So I mean that that's approximately uh, correct with respect to the existing square footage of the home. The additional square footage I can probably get that number, Mike, um, I have some, uh, um, go through my materials a little bit um, as, uh, as we continue discussion, but it's um, just the, the dimensions roughly of the uh, second story and the, and the vestibule there. So the addition is based on calculations that I'm, I'm seeing in my file now are roughly about an additional 500 square feet of living area. And part of that is the vestibule that is over an existing deck right now, so. I see, so that includes both the vestibule and the second story, that additional 500 square feet. That's correct. Okay. Um, <clears throat> going back to Mr. Delisle's question, the, if you look at the site plan, um, it looks like the expansion of the, that 5% additional, I realize a chunk of it is the uh, vestibule in the back, but pretty good sized chunk of it is also the, um, if that's proposed second story over the deck, I assume that they both, those are the two elements that add up to the 5%. Yeah, if you just blow up this drawing for the brown area there. So I just wanna make sure I understand the source of the additional um, coverage. So it's both that little box in the back where the vestibule is, as well as the box on the side, the proposed second story over deck. Is it those two? Yeah, the, the bump out um, and the, the two story portion, um, the second story portion and the, the vestibule. The lighter brown is, is a proposed deck and stair. Okay, so th those are the two, I just wanna make sure I understand. So those are the two components that contribute to that 5% increase in coverage. That's right, and there's already a bump out there on the um, on the first floor. We're just adding a second story for a bump out, and I, I think it's also worth noting that a, a substantial amount of this 
addition, in addition to having the added benefit of the mud room and the vestibule there is so that we can get a third bedroom. It's only a two bedroom home at, at current. Yeah. Okay, but I just wanna, I, 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 I'm not sure I followed. So the little bump out to the left that's over the porch, the porch isn't currently counted in the coverage, but with the bump out it is, or I, I'm just lost on, is the entire 5% the vestibule in the back or is it also that bump out over the porch? I think the, the way it's calculated, and, and again, we don't, I don't have my architect here with me uh, this evening, but I believe it was counted including because it again is over surface the way we mentioned in a, a prior proposal that um, we include that in the 5% uh, increase for the, um, for the lot coverage. So both rectangles. Okay. Yeah. All right. I don't, I don't have any other questions. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, pardon me. I just realized my video was off. Um, so uh, moving on then questions uh, from Mr. Delisle. To Chagan. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Mr. Chagan. Yeah, pardon me. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I, I guess just uh, jumping on uh, what my colleagues were asking, I was doing the math while we were chatting, and I think I think the actual addition is only around 207 square feet. The additional lot coverage, um, if you do the uh, if you do the math on the 4,700 square foot lot, um, and I the only reason I did it was to convince myself that that's a fairly small increase in you know, additional building, if you will. Um, for some reason, I, in my, I was thinking it was three or 400 square feet, but I think it's only 200. Um, with that said, I've got no other questions. Thank you. All right, Mr. Chagman, thank you. Um, Mr. Benick. Uh, I have no questions. My colleagues have covered the- Thank you, Mr. Benick, I agree. Um, I didn't have anything further. Um, I think by the time it gets to me, everyone's asked all the good questions. <laughs> Um, so I will go ahead and let there's, unless there's anything else, I'll go ahead and close um, the uh, questions from the board segment and we will go into deliberations and just to remind the board members that this is a special permit for nonconformities. So uh, we will just, I'll just ask that we deliberate, tailor our deliberations around the, uh, the legal criteria for a special permit for nonconformities and uh, we will start with Mr. Moore. Thank you, Chairman Jim Petty. Um, as I stated in, in deliberation, I mean, uh, in questions, I was initially concerned with, uh, uh, I think as many of the colleagues were with the, the lot coverage increase, um, but I get some notes here that I'm reading off of, so I don't miss anything. Um, but the plans um, as presented, I thought were, were very uh, thoughtful and I appreciate the applicant providing the renderings with the heights and in the site plan um, that was provided to us, as I said earlier. And I also thank the store commission for that suggestion. That was a good suggestion. Um, as we see plans as presented here, there's no new nonconformities created as we look at special permits and the hurdles that, again, have to be met uh, and cleared by an applicant. Um, so we go to, you know, size scale massing, you know, and among others to determine whether this is substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. And again, um, I, I, I think, you know, the bump up and back in the way that the addition is, has been thoughtfully um, added, second floor addition is added, and I, I don't find that mudroom to be anything but a, a good way to connect the the new with the old. Um, so I, I don't see any way, uh, given the neighborhood and where this is located and the thoughtful uh, presentation and, and um, engineering of the addition, I don't see any way this could be substantially more detrimental in my mind, so I can support it. All right, thank you, Mr. Moore. Mr. Delisle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I reached a similar conclusion as Mr. Moore. Um, I don't think that uh, this is substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. I think that from the approach down High Street, you know, with the rendering uh, that we're looking at right now, it might be, uh, you know, there might be some 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 massing there, but I don't think it's enough to to uh, get over the bar of substantially more detrimental. And uh, there's certainly no new nonconformity here. So with that, I can support this project. Thank you, Mr. Delisle. Uh, Mr. Swanton. Um, yeah, I, I concur. Um, I, um, I'm glad you went and got the historic commission support before coming to us. Um, 
I agree it's not substantially more detrimental and I agree from high street it's, you know, I think the fact that it's stepped back a little bit, you know, the, the roof height really helps. Um, and so I can support this uh, application. Thank you, Mr. Swanton. Uh, Mr. Chen. I agree with my colleagues. Um, great presentation. Uh, again, thanks for the renderings. Uh, I, you know, I, I think, I won't say it's modest, but I think it's tastefully done for, a, you know, a, a modest size house. And uh, my only concern was, uh, you know, the increased lot coverage, but, uh, uh, again, for this house in this area, I feel it's uh, modest and acceptable. So I can support the application. Thank you. Right, thank you, Mr. Chagman. Um, and finally, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Benick. Yeah, uh, I agree with my colleagues. I, I would say that certainly the issue of lot coverage and the size of this uh, addition, 500 feet or so, to a 1,500 foot house caught my eye and gave me some Pause. However, I, I conclude that the manner in which this addition is designed, its integration with the existing building, uh, all leads me to conclude that this improvement will not uh, be more detrimental to the neighborhood than what is there today. And similarly, I don't believe that the improvement is inconsistent uh, in terms of massing and size uh, as it relates to the uh, neighboring uh, home. So for those reasons, I, uh, I find it's uh, tasteful, uh, well done, and uh, I would approve it if I were voting. All right, thank you, Mr. Benick. I, um, I don't have anything further to add other than to reiterate that I too support it for the reasons that have uh, been stated and I believe that the applicant um, has met the, uh, the burden of making the, um, the showings uh, that the properties, that the proposal is not substantially more detrimental and that there's no new nonconformity or an intensification of an existing one. So I too can support it. If there's nothing else, uh, I will close deliberations and we will go to the vote. I'll ask uh, if any member has a motion to approve. Uh, I'll make a motion. Oh, go ahead. Go, go ahead, bud. Oh, all right. Okay. <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve 303 High Street, docket number ZNC 22-2, to construct an addition to the back portion of a single family structure extending existing nonconformities. I'll second that. Okay, motions made by, Ms., uh, made by I believe, Mr. Chen and uh, yes. seconded by Mr. Delisle. Calling the roll, uh, Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Delisle? Yes. Mr. Swanton? Yes. Mr. Shannon? Yes. And Rob Champetti, I vote yes. Uh, that's five in the affirmative. The ayes have it. The motion carries. And this special permit for nonconformities is approved. Thank you very much, um, Attorney Tallerman, for your presentation and uh, for your patience. And Thank you very much. All right. Moving on now to the, um, the last uh, hearing that is before us this evening. Um, this is a continuation uh, of, of the um, application on, th pardon me, I just lost my place here. Um, this is the uh, application on 344 High uh, Merrimack Street, a continuation from the hearing of, of January 25th, 2022. Um, there's two parts to this application as it originally presented to us. One was a variance request, lot area and rear yard setback, and the second was a special permit for non-conformities. Uh, the applicant sought to ex uh, an expansion of a pre-existing non-conforming structure. Uh, the application is uh, by Brad Kutcher. I'm sorry, by um, uh, is the applicant of uh, application of Brad Kutcher on 344 Merrimack Street, and I believe Nick Cracknell uh, is presenting on behalf of Mr. Kutcher. Um, Mr. Cracknell, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Champetti. Can everybody hear me? We can. Yes. Okay, just, just a point of order or a clarification. Um, this is a continuance, right, of the December meeting, and I didn't really prepare a presentation for going back through the material in December for probably a million good reasons. It was a long, long discussion. So are, who's, who's still voting on this application? Is it the same five members that were present in December, or is it different? Rob, you're muted. 
Thank you. Um, yes, the, um, the the five voting members this evening uh, are going to be myself, Mr. Moore, Mr. Delisle, Mr. Swanton, and Mr. Channing. Hey, Rob, do you think it makes sense for me to yield my voting rights to Mr. Benick since he sat in on the first oh, meeting? Um, had you qualified yourself uh, I, on this I, application? I have, but... Um, we have then... We, that then, um, well, so you either, if you qualified yourself and, and step up being qualified, then you would vote um, if you if you stepped back and recused yourself or or just stepped back administratively, Mr. Bennick would continue to vote and um, that's your call. Yeah, I guess I would step back and let Mr. Bennick do it. He was in the original, um, discussions, you know, everything I got was secondhand. And I, I think it would be uh, better for both the applicant and Mr. Benick if you would, if you would have chime in and, and be the voting member. Okay. And uh, then that means you'll, uh, you'll continue to remain a qualified voting member in the event of any, um, any conflict or recusal comes up during, during the pendency of this evening's presentation. And if one member has to step down, uh, you're the guy. Okay, excellent. All right, um, thank you for that. So, um, so Mr. Cracknell, just to reiterate for the record yes. and for you, um, our voting members this evening uh, will be a continuation of the same voting members from when you were back before us on the 25th of January. It's myself, Mr. Moore, Mr. Delisle, um, uh, Mr. Swanton, and Mr. Benick. Understood, and I appreciate that. Um, yeah, thank you for uh, asking. Walter. My apologies okay. for, the, uh, for the oversight. No problem. So, what I'm going to focus on briefly, so we're not here as long as we were last uh, December, is focus on the issues and concerns that were expressed primarily from the board members, members of the public that participated in that meeting, and uh, city staff, which were also present in that meeting with some comments on this particular application. So there are about 15 slides here. I'll be done in 15 minutes, uh, so don't be frightened. It's, it's not going to be a repeat of December, which I apologize was long. So if we can go to the next slide, please. The primary issues of concern, as at least we heard them, uh, were related to, you know, where's that building gonna be situated? There was discussion in the December meeting about moving it six feet further towards the, the, the image you see of the two structures on the slide. I think everybody's aware of this from December. The proposed house is on top and the lower right is the existing house uh, being restored. So we went out and we staked the uh, the building location as discussed in, Dece in December, and we invited several neighbors to that discussion. Uh, the corners were staked, and we discussed um, a whole host of things on the site, uh, from fencing, landscaping, moving the structure further up Union Place towards uh, Merrimack Street, getting out of the way of the utility pole and the driveway across the road for the house at the bottom of Union Place. So we did uh, actually move the house 25 feet along that rear yard setback that we're proposing at 20 feet. So the house is considerably further from Merrimack Court in what's before you tonight. And we did submit this back in January for those of you that had a chance to look at it before the meeting that didn't happen. Uh, so we, we have communicated in all forms of communication with each of the abutting property owners, as well as some that don't directly abut the property, but they're in the surrounding uh, neighborhood. Uh, we've met with public works and the, the city engineer in respect to roadway and utility improvements that we discussed in December, namely the water and sewer connections. And we, um, we propose to grant the city easements for the portions of the street that are actually on this property. Um, and we talked about you know, tree preservation in respect to the elm tree behind the house, introducing some street trees on Union, Union Place, and preserving water views for one of the direct abutters in the previous 6C project uh, next door at 342 Merrimack Street. From the city side, there were uh, questions about the elevations uh, and, and whether they were accurate to reflect the city engineer's request that we meet the projected flood elevation of the Merrimack River in 2100, rather than where we sit now at 2022. And the projected uh, flood elevation is six feet above the eight feet that FEMA now has as a base flood elevation on the Merrimack River, which would mean it need the uh, first floor they would like to see elevated at least 14 feet above sea level. So we've made an adjustment of adding one step uh, that's all we needed to add once we got spot grades. We had to go out before the snowstorm and identify 
the uh, the existing grade where the proposed house is going to be located in order to establish a first floor elevation that's six feet above the floodplain. We did that. We've communicated with the city engineer and the planning department and and updated the elevations and the site plan to reflect that. Um, the other city issues raised in December related to the wetland, uh, the, the wetland buffer. Uh, there is a wetland beside the property at the foot of this property on Merrimack Court. It has not been delineated for any project, including the one next door that's considerably closer to that, that uh, wetland. Um, so we were asked if what the distance would be between this proposed house and where that suspected wetland is. And we sent a wetland scientist out to go and identify where he believed the wetland was closest and then measured it. And we are approximately 95 to 100 feet away. And I believe there's a letter in the record. It's at least been uploaded from the conservation agent of the city indicating that she agrees with the assessment from our wetland scientists that there's likely to be no permitting required other than erosion control uh, during construction should this house be approved. So those were the city issues. The board issues as at least I understood them was making sure we, we took another pass at the hardship criteria and in particular focused on the, the waterfront marine district which this is located in and determine whether the lot is actually unique. Are there other properties that are similar to this that would maybe make this request less reasonable, less uh, a special privilege uh, than it might be. So we've, we've done, I've done a, uh, an analysis of 107 prop, seven properties that are in the waterfront uh, marine district, sorry, not mixed use, marine district uh, along the waterfront. You, you folks asked us to make sure we got the roof deck on here because as everybody knew in December, this house was initially modeled on the house that was constructed across from the Atkinson Common by Brad. We went through the same process to do uh, with the Board of Adjustment, with the ZBA, to do the same house uh, up on Ferry Road. So we had used those elevations and they did not have a roof deck because there wasn't one there. So we have updated the elevations to show that. And the last piece from the board, I think, was updating the site plan to not only show where we're putting the house, uh, sliding it towards Merrimack uh, Street, but also uh, showing the footprint of the new house that was recently finished and constructed next door as part of a 6C last year that was approved for 342 Merrimack. So we did that. Next, please. So our, our design response, as I said, we staked the foundation. We had a meeting with the neighbors that were available at the time. Uh, and we, and some of the neighbors are not uh, frequently residing in their structures. So there's been a lot of communication by email, text, or phone conversations to keep them in the loop as to what we're doing and what we're thinking and getting feedback from them on how we can make it better. Next, please. So the revised site plan that's before you tonight, that's a little bit different than the one in December is we slid that house, which is shown in brown, the proposed house with a garage sitting further back. We slid both those structures about 22 feet towards Merrimack uh, Street, which is where the existing blue house is at 344. And we did that for a variety of reasons. It, it seemed like the front yard setback of where that house was located further down towards Merrimack Court was crowding the lot, crowding the intersection, crowding the driveway across the road and the utility pole that's currently there with a fair bit of uh, telecommunications and other utility uh, connections on that pole were closely located to the center of that house. Now they're not in front of the house and we've increased the front yard setback for that front door from about five and a half feet to eight feet. So it's a much more comfortable landing and steps and a walkway to get out to the edge of the street. Next, please. So this just shows you the two structures again that are, on, that are proposed, the existing being on the left and the lower right, the proposed house. Next, please. So in, in terms of the adjustments we made as part of the neighborhood conversations and discussions with you folks back in December, where we added shade trees just running around this quick, uh, shade trees along Union Place. There were none there in our prior, we didn't have a landscape plan in December. So this is the site plan that's added in a layer for landscaping. We narrowed the existing driveway that is currently wide enough for three cars to go side by side behind the existing structure. There's no need for that much impervious surface uh, or driveway. So we've narrowed it to be the same general typical 
driveway width so two cars could fit side by side four cars would fit in that driveway without uh being in union place the same applies for our proposed garage two cars fit in the garage and it's a modest garage at 22 feet square and two cars fit outside the garage with at least eight or nine feet behind the bumper of the garage uh, of the cars outside the garage before you even get close to union place so we narrowed the driveway we have an additional right-of-way easement it's not very big but a portion of union place is paved on 344 Merrimack up near Merrimack Street. So we're proposing to give the city an easement for the existing pavement on both the bottom of Union Place and the top. Um, you know, we shifted the garage uh, to reflect the shift in the house. We've added open space where the barn we proposed to, to remove. The barn has a big hole in the roof. It's going to be, it's, it's basically removed itself, but we're proposing to replace it instead of a driveway, which is what was shown in, um, in December with grass. So there's added open space. We've added a privacy fence as part of the site walk and discussing uh, some of the water view concerns of the abutter at 342 Merrimack that did the previous 6C with the new house down on Merrimack Court. We've added a, a five foot privacy fence along between the garage and the backyard of the proposed structure to uh, align in some fashion with the fence that's already been erected recently around that new house on Merrimack Court. Uh, we've got better protection for the Elm tree there shown in green between the two structures. We're gonna preserve that, it's on our property. It'll be uh, protected with a, a snow fence, hurricane fence during construction. Um, we have a, a very small line you can see on a diagonal through the lot. That's, that's designating the view easement we're willing to give the abutting property owner that voiced that concern back. This is again, 342 Merrimack, the person in the blue house next to ours on Merrimack Street. He would like to retain his view it's a seasonal view to the Merrimack uh, River. We, we're gonna honor that with a deeded view easement that will prevent construction or planting of tall plants other than the existing elm tree in that triangular space. We've added a decorative, decorative fence along Merrimack Court up into the corner of the house on Union Place. And we, we talked about increasing the setback from Union Place by sliding the house up, the lot is tapered and We've added the footprint again of that house in the lower right is the brand new house that was built under last year's 6C. Next, please. So real quick, not a whole lot of change here other than the front yard setback uh, has been increased. That 5.7 is the corner of the house that's near the utility pole. So that's the closest. That, that was just under four feet in December. So we've increased the front yard setback, but we've maintained the rear at 20. And the rear is really aside, but because of the nuance of the zoning uh, ordinance, 344 Merrimack with its address and front door on 344 on Merrimack Street actually has its legal frontage because it's longer along Union Place, which creates the rear yard instead of a side yard, uh, where a side yard is 20 feet, a rear is 25, we're proposing we can only fit 20, um, but it's consistent with the surrounding character. And the 13,892 square feet is 93% of what's required under a two family use in the WMD district. Next, please. So this is our updated elevation that shows the, uh, not the hip roof anymore, but the, uh, the roof deck on the left. We have one additional step. That's all we needed to get this 14 feet above sea level uh, at the top, a finished floor grade of the first floor. Um, we are not proposing a basement. We are proposing a crawl space, which is what they did next door at 342 uh, Mer and Merrimack. And the new house has actually got an address on Merrimack Court. Uh, this shows the wood uh, cedar roof, the brick chimney. We're doing a brick shelf foundation. So this, this house is going to look like it was always there when it's completed. Next, please. The rear elevation is, it, it looks like this. You could see the uh, roof deck on the right. This is facing union place from the rear yard. Next, please. In terms of the, uh, the side of the structure, uh, this, the elevations that we included in the, uh, on the online permit uh, show the actual building height and the height of this building under zoning is just under, it's 19 and a half feet to the midpoint of that, that gable roof. And it's 26 feet to the ridge for what it's worth. The zoning uh, maximum is 25 and we're at 19.5. So you can't get much more modest than this from a building height standpoint. The structure is just under 2000 square feet. So it's not a big structure either. Uh, but the building height using the, ex the existing grade here is uh, 12 and a half feet above sea level. And we are 
pushing the first floor up to 14 feet, which is a foot and a half, 18 inches. That's the, the landing and a step and um, uh, six inches of fill to create positive drainage around the structure in order to achieve that 18 inches. Next, please. So real, I'm not gonna go through each one of these. Obviously there were concerns about uh, traffic impacts on Merrimack Court. We're proposing uh, to uh, plant a tree at the bottom of this lot, if, if within the city right away, if the city, um, the city uh, DPS or whoever is approving street trees, I heard it earlier and I apologize, I forget the name of the uh, the committee, but if the, the street tree committee or whatever they're, they're termed uh, would like us to plant a tree at the bottom of the lot where there's a bunch of dirt uh, next to Merrimack Court, we're willing to do that. It was important for the neighbors, at least prior to December, and I still think it is that they, there be a construction management plan filed prior to construction that manages where the contractors are going to park. They're, they're meant to park on site using these two driveways. The driveways go in first, the garage won't go first. There'll be room to park and use it the lot as a staging area to avoid some of the problems that occurred at the bottom of 240, uh, 342 Merrimack, where there was more compression, less frontage, and greater difficulty in um, managing Merrimack Court around that development. So I think I've covered all those pieces. I'm not gonna drill back through them. There is an affordable housing requirement that comes with the amendment to 6C from, from last spring that will require about a $40,000 check to be cut to the city, to the Affordable Housing Trust, should the 6C be approved by the planning board. And that, that money goes to wherever the trust deems it appropriate, uh, but that was not on the books uh, prior to that last spring. So that's, it's, I'm just pointing that out. And we are proposing a restrictive covenant or a deed restriction that the density of this property at two units remain that way uh, and that there be no uh, future requests for additional units on the property. Next, please. So uh, I had proposed back in December, I typically do this on all my projects to make sure there's clarity and we memorialize agreements between parties so everybody's comfortable as to a if should we get to the finish line and get the project approved, it gets built as presented and modified through these many meetings. Uh, that was the attempt I made in putting that document together. It's meant to be just a template, a suggested stipulations to again codify and memorialize the agreements we've made, not only with you, but with the neighbors. I understand the planning department has gone through and uh, many of these uh, stipulations that were suggested have their own form and uh, and uh, and are included as boilerplate conditions in other applications. So I think the planning department has revised this, pared it down uh, to meet uh, their programmatic needs for uh, an approval should it come uh, with this project. Next, please. So just uh, looking at the revised uh, hardship criteria. Clearly, we have a very unique lot shape in that this, you know, I'm not going to go through every one of these bullets, but what's different between this presentation and perhaps December is I did go out and look at the WMD district and, uh, you know, whether there's 107 or 109 lots, it's somewhere near that ballpark. I use the city mapping package uh, software to look at each of the three districts. And there's a map here at the end, should we, you, you be more interested in what I found that identifies the WMD district across the waterfront. And I only found one other lot that has uh, public streets on three sides of the lot like this one. We have Merrimack Court, Union Place and Merrimack Street. Uh, Zero Pop Crowley Way is also on three streets and three sides. And if you look at that slide, it should you be interested at the back of this presentation, you'll see that a, a 6C and a, a, a bunch of variances were granted for that large three family structure behind a very large structure on Merrimack Street that has a 5,000 square foot parking lot associated with it. So it, it's a pretty urban uh, environment in contrast to ours, but there's nobody else that, uh, that I could find in the district that has a similar circumstance, has a two family already established. It's already a condominium, not an apartment. So you've already got a, a split in ownership on the property and you've got frontage on three streets and a long narrow lot that tapers. That's what we feel is unique about this property. You know, we think it's a reasonable request because it's, it, it is uh, unique and it's similar to the abutting lot. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the questions that was raised by both a member, uh, I think it was Ken or Mark, sorry, um, 
and it might have been Ken too, uh, it was asking in December, gee, a, a very good question. Uh, if 6C changed and they created uh, the planning board and the city council a larger minimum lot size uh, amongst some other changes, but that was the biggie and that's, <clears throat> that's one of the two, excuse me, variances we need. Is this project proposal for 344 Merrimack Street that we're talking about tonight, is it aligned or is it in conflict with what the spirit and intent of that amendment was last spring? And I wasn't able to answer that in December. And what I was encouraged to do from the planning director is reach out to at least the chair or the vice chair of the planning board, because they were both involved with that drafting process and ask them what they think about uh, that question. And uh, I reached out to Rick Tainer and we had a very careful conversation, not wanting to talk about 344 Merrimack Street, because should this be approved, we're going to be in front of the planning board. Uh, and Rick would be viewing that uh, presumably for the first time with fresh eyes and not wanting to go on record, uh, you know, weighing in on the merits of the elements of this application. So uh, conveniently, we had the ability to look next door where we have almost the same project that was approved with the old 6C amendment, which is 342 Merrimack. And uh, Rick made it very clear to me, uh, and I wasn't surprised to hear it, that the planning board, he believed the planning board was not targeting that kind of, this kind of development or that one was what we talked about, 342, right next door, that it was his impression that was actually a positive development under 6C for the city of Newburyport. And an example of one they were trying to uh, discourage was the one across the road at 311 Merrimack, where a uh, fairly large single family structure was being proposed behind an existing structure uh, as a back house in uh, sort of nested in into a neighborhood rather than fronting on a street beside another principal structure. So th that was very, uh, I think, good feedback from Rick. Uh, again, not on the merits of this application, but that the project next door, which has less land than we do, less setbacks than we do, and more compression and less turning movements, less parking than we're able to achieve here that was not a, a model of something the city did not want to see moving forward. In fact, it, it was the inverse. So I, I feel like we, we, we turned that rock and got that feedback. Hopefully you'll, you'll agree. Uh, I didn't know how else to do it. And again, took direction from the planning director on, on how to answer that. So, um, you know, obviously the hardship's not self-imposed. Uh, they, they didn't change the lot and the ordinance has changed. Uh, and there's no special privilege in my mind, again, relating to the analysis that I did. There's only two lots like this and the other ones like more than developed uh, on Pop Crowley Way. So we've got 93% of what's required. So it's it, to, to me, it's always been important that that number is not 50% or 40. We're, we're very close to what the requirement is for a two family and the use already exists. And the setbacks in looking at the surrounding neighborhood we may call that a rear, as I said, but it functions as a side yard, and that's consistent with everybody else in this triangular block uh, of properties. So next, please. Again, we went through the findings. I, I took an effort uh, to maybe refine them. Obviously, the use is permitted. It's already there. I think it's desirable uh, as a two-family because it's a permitted use. It's not going to create undue traffic impacts because the use is already there. The second unit happens to have somebody in it that does not, uh, it's a very passive use because of the tenancy of the second unit, but it's not restricted to one person or somebody with a mobility impairment that's going to make the house give the neighbor an impression there really is only one family living in it. It is a two family and it's a condominium project. Um, you know, I think we've met the conditions of the special permit as attributed to the special permit for nonconformities to make the adjustments. I think we actually strengthen the integrity and character of the neighborhood rather than diminish it. Uh, it's not an excess. This is a neighborhood with one and two family uses. Uh, and I think, again, it's in harmony, purpose, and intent of the ordinance and consistent with the neighborhood. And ultimately, obviously, the planning board is going to have to decide on their own independently whether this uh, project merits uh, being able to get a building permit and come to fruition. Um, so we don't, we don't create an environmental impact that's adverse. I would argue we actually improve 
the environmental impacts by building this house in respect that we are 100 feet from the wetlands. We are going to use erosion control, but importantly, we're going to replace uh, a water line that appears to be uh, out of compliance for the house at the end of Union Place and maybe even uh, according to the owner, a public health uh, risk if it's lead, uh, which again has been suggested by that property owner, we're gonna replace that at our cost. And we're also going to connect the house at the end of Union Place while we do this work to our sewer extension um, uh, connection on Merrimack Court because the house unbeknownst to a lot of people at the end of Union Place is on a septic system in the middle of the city. So there's an environmental benefit to this project and we, are, we have worked diligently with that um, abutter, Cindy, to make her situation uh, hopefully much better. Next, please. Almost done. So we, the benefits, there's no new housing units. Yeah, there's a new house, but there's no new units. The existing house is a modest house. It's got 1,500 square feet of living area on one side and 1,000 on the other. So when Sam, Sam, Sam and Michelle uh, move into the second unit, remove the kitchen, they're gonna have a 2,500 square foot house. They're not proposing any additions. Uh, it, it's gonna sit there comfortably, it'll be restored. One of the pangs of condominiums is the loss of control and being able to prevent bad things from happening unless the condominium association is written really tightly, which is why all the windows were removed on the smaller side and replaced with vinyl replacement windows that are completely inconsistent with the character of the house and the windows that are on Sam and Michelle's side. So there'll be continuity, uniformity, and uh, a major restoration and facelift to that house should this move forward. Uh, there'll be a preservation restriction should the, again, planning board and the historic commission support doing so. We have no reason to believe they, they wouldn't uh, should we get there. There's the affordable housing payment. And again, I think property values uh, will, will significantly appreciate uh, in this neighborhood uh, with, with the uh, approval of this project. Next, please. So I guess I'm done. Uh, that's back to the site plan and sort of where we've landed. Hopefully there are some other slides that I could use if you had questions about the WMD or about Pop Crowley Way, the floodplain, I did include some information, but that's, that, that's really the, uh, the end of my presentation, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Mr. Cracknell. Um, so um, with that, we will now uh, close that portion of the public hearing and we'll go into public comment and uh, members of the uh, public and members of the audience, uh, if you aren't already familiar with this process, you'll see a a placard up on their, your screen now, which just governs the uh, rules of the road. We'll ask you to raise your hand. I'll recognize you. Please give your name and your address for the record and try to keep your remarks uh, to within two minutes, just in the interest of time and everyone having an opportunity to speak. So with that, uh, I will recognize the first hand I see, which is Ken Akala. And forgive me, uh, Ken, if I've mispronounced your name, but um, that's okay. go ahead and pro promote you to the panel. Uh, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. It's um, Ken Okaya, and I live here with my wife, Becky Dill, at 348 Merrimack Street. Um, we're abutters to, we're neighbors to the abutters at 346 Merrimack, then ours. Um, everything we've seen tonight, we found really impressive and as neighbors to the project. We support the Kimballs and their design team and Nick and their efforts to make changes requested by all these parties. I think they've come up with a great design that allows for not only you know significant improvement to their primary residence, but also is a very very smart use of of the space behind their home. We think you know we reviewed the design for the new home and we think it's well designed, and the location seems appropriate. And I learned a bunch of new things tonight with respect to the efforts they're making to preserve the space as well as improve the infrastructure that I wasn't aware of before or had missed and. I found those really impressive. And I can't speak for my wife, Becky, but I think she feels the same way. Absolutely. So thank you for the opportunity and um, we support this project. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mr. and Mrs. Okaya. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, next hand I see Stephen S or Steve S. I don't have a last name, but Steve S, if that's you. Uh, just give your name and address for the record and you have the floor. Great, thank you. Uh, this is Steve Sheppy. I'm here with my wife, Karen. We live at Three Couriers Landing. Uh, we've been in this neighborhood for about 32 years or so. And I just wanna start by saying that uh, we do very much appreciate 
the approach that our neighbors and their partners have taken on this project and engaging uh, the full neighborhood. So just want to acknowledge that. A um, couple comments, one just on the uh, wetland issue. I do believe there's a swale on the back side of the proposed property uh, between that property and the newly constructed home it does periodically have running water. And I don't know if that qualifies as wetland or not, but uh, I did not see that addressed uh, in the materials. Um, and then secondly, just uh, sort of consistent with our comments uh, in the earlier um, session to review this, uh, I, th I do think we continue to be um, uncomfortable with the added density uh, in the neighborhood um, with this project, especially given uh, the very small lot and the impact on the density in the neighborhood for the home that was constructed uh, recently on, on Merrimack Court. Um, and that's really the extent of our comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll recognize uh, Michelle Kimball. Ms. Kimball, um, you wanna just unmute your mic? You have the floor. Hi, this is Michelle Kimball, wife of Sam Kimball, um, co-owner of 344 Merrimack Street. And um, I just wanted to reiter reiterate that we've we've really um, thank you neighbors for um, expressing that you you appreciate that we've really tried we really have given lots of thought planning and outreach to um, the whole neighborhood and um, and for taking into consideration a beautification of not only this this. Um, 1805 Levi Carr house we love historic house um, and we we hope that this project um, can be approved so we can take good care of this this house thank you very good um, thank you and um, let's see um, yeah. Alana and Christopher well, he's gonna know it's gonna come up as Michelle Kimball again um, sorry uh, Let's see, we have Alana and Christopher Reynolds. Uh, if you could unmute your mic and uh, you uh, you have the floor for your comments. Hi, this is Alana um, Ali Reynolds. I live on uh, two Merrimack courts. So I'm further um, up the street from the, the newly um, constructed house and the proposed um, construction by the Kimballs. And uh, we've been in this neighborhood for about eight, going on nine years now. And um, we, um, we're we actually in support of the, the plan. Um, we hadn't, um, you know, we had certain reservations regarding especially the, um, the overload on the sewer and water drainage, but the proposed plan to, to improve the situation on the property on Union Place, as well as to, you know, um, tie in, um, you know, all those uh, sewer uh, lines um, it has alleviated our biggest, that, that was one of our biggest concerns. And um, as well as um, the site plan with the property facing Union Place, as opposed to Merrimack Court, um, I think, and being pushed further back up Union Place, I think, will alleviate some of the density issues um, on Union Court. Oh, sorry, on uh, Merrimack Court. And so, I think um, um, I was uh, I was pleasantly um, surprised and relieved, and I feel uh, confident that Sam and Michelle will will um, beautify uh, this neighborhood, which historically was uh, actually um, a pretty dense neighborhood back in the day. So um, I. Uh, yeah, um, my husband, Christopher, and I, um, we're, we're both in support of the project. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Reynolds, and thank you, uh, Mr. Reynolds. And uh, we will go now to uh, Daniel Denner. Uh, Mr. Denner, um, you can just unmute your mic and, and uh, you now have the floor. Thank you. Um, I wanna say thanks to uh, you know all the work that was done to take into consideration, you know, the various concerns from last time. I feel like that was comprehensive. I did not have concerns from last time and my wife, Stephanie and I are in support of this for many of the same reasons uh, 
articulated by Ken Akaya and um, Alana that the main things are that, you know, the addition, instead of making an addition onto Sam's and Michelle's house, the creation of a nice single family, you know, is a more desirable um, way to do that. Um, we also, so I'm at 346 Merrimack, we're the direct of butter. And, um, you know, the traffic on Union Place uh, is not really been an issue. I think we've mentioned that the last time. I know there'll be some construction here and there, but um, then, you know, the idea that these improvements are the other thing that we uh, support where to Sam and Michelle's house, um, the type of care that they're taking to, you know, put together the new house it, along with the new um, considerations for sewer and water. Um, so, we, we, we wanted to say that we, we support it as well. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for those comments, Mr. Denner. Um, I see um, Cynthia Lee Blatt. Um, oh, no, I don't. <laughs> uh, looks like we have another Kimball, and I don't know if it's the same or different, but it just says S. Kimball, if that is uh, you. Um, Please uh, feel free to unmute your mic and uh, you have the floor. Uh, yes, uh, it's Sam Kimball. I'm the husband of Michelle Kimball who already spoke and one of the owners here at 344 Merrimack. Uh, first of all, I just wanna thank everyone who is attending tonight. I appreciate you taking the time and consideration. Um, this whole historic preservation project is actually really important to us. Um, I've been a Newburyport resident for the last 40 years. Um, I grew up in Ipswich in a house very similar, in fact, a bit older than the one we're in here now at 344 Merrimack, and thus appreciate the charm, upkeep, and added value to the neighborhood that this kind of historical house brings. We bought our condo here seven years ago with the hopes of buying the other side and owning the whole single family residence. We knew we would eventually need to house our family. So now that we actually own the whole house, um, the plans are not only incorporating the growing family aspect, but also knowing the financial demands of what lays ahead. Um, you know, for us to achieve the end goal with this house, doing a 6C would actually allow us to um, accelerate the process of renovating the property back to its original state, you know, as a single family house and provide my family with the living space that we need in addition to the you know, historical uh, improvements and uh, respect that um, doing the renovations would bring. Um, so I just wanted to say that and thanks again for everyone for listening. Very good. Thank you for your, uh, for your comments, Mr. Kimball. Um, let's see, I see uh, Bradley Kutcher. I see uh, Brad Kutcher's hand up and uh, Mr. Kutcher, you could uh, just unmute your mic. You have the floor. Certainly, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Brad Kutcher and I would be the uh, proposed contractor for this job. I just want to take a minute to, to express, um, number one, my, my thanks to Nick Racknell and all the time and energy he's put into this. Uh, between Nick and I, we've taken great pains and time to meet with the neighbors, um, which has been difficult because everyone's got busy schedules. Can you, but can you hear me? Is we can hear you. Yeah. Yes. Is able okay, to get into the, can you? Nick, let me, let me continue. So we, uh, we've reached out to all the neighbors, both in person, email, texts, and phone calls. We've listened to concerns. We've also spoke to the planning board, the planning department. We've listened to what their uh, suggestions were. We've implemented that. We listened, like I said, to the neighbors there. We, we know that one of the neighbors is, is looking for improvements to both the water and the sewer infrastructure in their home. And we volunteered to do that. In fact, I believe one, that one of the uh, problems is a failed septic system. I spoke to the uh, city engineer, department has a water and sewer and received their permission actually quite enthusiastically telling them that we would be making these improvements. And they said, absolutely, that's, that's an allowable use. You can do that. We thank you for doing it. We then were asked um, by the planning department to check the wetlands, as Nick mentioned, and we reached out to Sea Camp Environmental. We hired them. They came out to delineate that part of the wetlands there. We wrote the letter, as Nick mentioned. We think we're uh, far enough away where we will not impact wetlands in any way, shape or form. We then uh, engaged Scott Brown, well, we initially engaged Scott Brown to draw the house, but then we re-engaged him 
to show the improvements we're making to our house, uh, right down to the brick foundation, the brick shelf. And, and I want to take a minute just to tell you everything we're doing in the house. We, we're providing true divided glass, the brick foundation, uh, wood cedar shake roof, brick chimney, granite front steps, a brick walkway, entire sod front lawn. We're taking down the uh, dilapidated barn that's adjacent to that property. And we're gonna open, make the open space and saw that right over. It was cedar siding. We've implemented street trees. We hired Howard Schneider to uh, beef up our landscape plan. And uh, I believe Nick showed that tonight, but we have a nice landscape plan we can share with all the abutters. Uh, we, uh, like I said, we're removing the old barn next door there. We've agreed to uh, grant a, a, a site easement to the abutter next door, Mr. Lynch. So his views will never be affected of the river. And we're incorporating some additional street trees on the public way, as well as granting the city an easement for their, uh, their payment that actually encroaches on our property. So we've done uh, everything we can do to, to work with the neighborhood, to work with the city, and to make improvements to both the neighborhood, the neighbors, and even the home that we're working in there, or that we're proposing to build there. So I, I believe we've listened to everybody, we've heard them, we thank them all for their input. It was excellent input. And I just wanted to let the board know that we've taken that to heart and I believe this plan shows everything that was asked and then some of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kutcher. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes. It, I've got Cindy Blatt on the phone. Can, can I see if, if she's having trouble, I guess, being recognized? Do you see her with her hand up? Um, I see Cynthia Lee Blatt, but I, her hand is not up. Could. Yeah, yeah, I'm having trouble. All right. Um, Let's see if you can hear her. This is a weird way of doing it, but she she is wondering why she can't get through. But let's try this. Go, Cindy. Hi, um, I'm trying to. I'm having difficulty. You can hear me. I... Yeah, Cindy, you you have to mute yourself there because we're getting feedback from your computer. Okay. And talk on the phone through me. I just wanted to. Um, What's your address, Cindy? All right, well, then I'll just go through the computer, I guess. No, no, just give your name and address and then say what you want to say. It's Cindy Blatt, 11 Union Place. I own the property on Union Place. And I wanted to let everybody know that I am in support of what Mr. Cracknell has been showing everyone tonight and that um, I think that it is definitely going to improve the neighborhood and I think he's gone out of his way to uh, to make the um, neighborhood part of this project and I have no no problems with it going forward okay Cindy all right very good thank um thank you miss uh, miss Blatt and I appreciate your uh your creativity and making sure that we got to hear uh, hear your thoughts and thank you uh, <laughs> yeah. thank thank you uh, Mr. Cracknell for 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 bouncing uh, bouncing it off of uh, one or two satellites to get it to us. Um, I am looking and I do not see any new hands. Uh, I see folks actually. If anyone who has already spoken, if you if you do not wish to speak further, could I ask you to just kindly click your hand down so I'll know whether um, you actually do wish to be re-recognized or whether we can move move along. That'll allow me to disregard hands that are raised. Um, and ironically, I do see Cynthia Lee Blatt's hand up now. <laughs> <laughs> um, does Ms. Blatt wish to speak further? Up, oh, it's down, okay. I, uh, I cannot tell, but if Ms. Blatt, if you can hear me um, and you can unmute your mic, you can give it a try if in fact your hand means that you do wish to uh, add a, a further comment. If not, I'm going to close the public comment section because I see no further hands up. All right, um, we'll assume that uh, Ms. Blatt's comments um, that, that she had said what, uh, what she wanted to say to us. It sounded as though she did. Um, and uh, if I'm mistaken, we can revisit. But uh, we will go ahead with that. I see no further hands. I'm going to go ahead and close that portion of the public hearing. And uh, we will go um, into questions from the board. And we will begin with uh, Mr. Moore. 
please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a question, uh, Nick, as always, very thorough. I'm not sure you kept your 15 minute time limit, but I know <laughs> you try. Um, I had a question on the, the proposed new structure. Um, I think moving it back in response to abutters concerns and uh, to make improvements to sight lines, et cetera, was, uh, was great. But you said that the setback is 5.7 feet and yeah. I had gone by, like you said earlier before the snowstorm um, and checked out the stakes and it seemed like at least that, that corner stake farthest away from Merrimack Street was a lot closer than 5.7. Is that the 5.7 you're referencing? And is Hopefully it just my you can bad hear me. Or? Can you hear I can me? Hear you. Yep. Okay, thank you. No, those stakes out there were the six feet that we were talking about in the December meeting. That That's when we, we put them out there and then moved the structure. Okay. Uh, I can tell you that if the stakes, I know when we did our site visit with the neighbors, we, we moved some of the stakes around. Mm -hmm. I think there was snow on the ground. So I haven't been down to the property in the last two weeks to see exactly where, what landed or whether anything's been moved. But I can tell you that the the 5.7 feet is the corner of the house that would be essentially if you drove by the house, there's a guy coming off that telephone pole mm -hmm. onto our property. So a guy is, you know, supporting the pole. Yep. The corner of the house is probably a foot behind the guy. Okay. And then the rest of the house in front of the front door is about eight feet away from the edge of pavement. So, I mean, exactly. if, if there's two feet of snow, definitely things will probably get close to that corner as they do now, but I, I don't see it going up on the house. Okay. Um, and again, I do recall, I, I think I did see it before the expected meeting and at the, at the end of January before we had to, to reschedule. So it was before the snow, but I think it was after they'd been moved into correct space, but I do remember being close to the guy. So I just might be a horrible judge of space. Um, it just appeared to be closer. Um, again, a, a lot of great uh, positives to, to everything that's being proposed here and, and the communication is key. Um, but one thing that was that was left out and it was brought up at the last meeting, and I think I may have brought this up too, is that the discussion of having an alternate plan, and I thought it was in, it was in the prior plans about expanding off the back of the house, and I'm not sure that was fleshed out enough on why that yeah. doesn't work. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh, I had included in the December PowerPoint, amongst another 39 slides, um, the prospect of having a reasonably sized addition on the back of the house in order to make that thousand square foot unit, you know, at least 500 square feet larger to be the same as the one on the other side. Mm -hmm. And um, what, I, what I obviously didn't make clear in the presentation but it was my intention and I did try and correct it in that presentation. But I, I think again, going on for an hour and a half, uh, I lost some of you, um, is that that addition could be created without a variance, but it could not be created as a right. That, that because this property, because of the zoning amendment in the last 10 odd years that shifted the front yard of the property from its street address, to its longest frontage on a street that it is uh, aligned with, in this case, three streets, the frontage of this property for the first 200 years was on the front yard and the frontage under zoning, at least since the 20s or 30s when zoning was adopted, was on Merrimack Street, where you'd expect it to be, where the front door is and the number over the door. But in the last 10 years, the zoning changed and and change the front yard to the longest street frontage, which then makes the front yard of this property, the principal front yard union place, which then creates as an opposite property line, a rear yard out of what was for 190 years, a side yard between 342 and 344, which really acts and looks like a side yard, not a rear yard, if you're between those two houses on Merrimack Street. But that's actually a rear yard under zoning now between this 344 and 342 up on Merrimack Street. So you can't do an, the, the Kimballs cannot do an as of right addition on the back of that structure because the front yard setback, it may, it's less than one foot on that back corner. Uh, they, they can't fill that in without at least a special permit for nonconformities to put an addition on the back of that house because that is a front yard, not a rear yard behind that house. 
So I think I, I didn't make that clear enough, uh, at least in my mind, when I made the presentation. Uh, you, you can't do anything without a variance, but you can't do anything without a special permit for nonconformities either. So this is a reasonable alternative to trying to jam uh, an addition. Remember the small units on Union Place, it's not on the 342 Merrimack side of the house, the small uh, unit. So the addition would be along the back of the unit because this is already condoed. It's not an apartment building. It's not a two family. They happen to own both condominiums, but they're not obligated to keep one of them. It's already been condominiumized uh, with a site plan and the small units on the intersection of those two streets. So the addition would presumably be attached to it, be behind it, would further crowd Union Place. The abutters that spoke tonight on the other side would be further crowded and the lot would be further crowded and it wouldn't benefit the traffic flow to have more structure behind the structure right up against Union Place should you even grant the special permit for nonconformities. All right, so if we if um, if you were to build, would you say it's fair to say that if you if you were to opt for going for a special permit, build off the back of the, the old historic structure, you would have to angle it to fit. Right, it, would, it wouldn't you probably would build would, off or the you'd back. You'd it, have to angle yeah, to make it work because of the way right. the building's situated on the lot. It would. Yep. You couldn't go straight out. You'd be in the middle of Union Place. Correct. Or you'd angle it, or, or you'd you step know. it back, or you know it would be awkward. Or you'd rip something off the back of the house there and rework, you know, that space. In, but it it certainly wouldn't be better for that house or that intersection or that street to be forced to work in that space. And in contrast, you know, you've been down there, uh, can there's a there's like an I don't know it feels like an eight foot fence I think it's six feet on top of a retaining wall behind that addition that goes down to the shade tree so it's pretty oppressive when you're going down there to go down the side of this house and then see an eight foot sort of falling down fence almost that's creating privacy for that unit owner on the corner well, we're proposing to get rid of that and rework that open it up and create you know an open space there or a garden that doesn't need a wall between union place and the edge of pavement and the backyard so i i think i think those are all important considerations to what we're doing here to really treat with 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 great respect union place which has really been like an alleyway or a passageway for a long time by the way it looks for people to flow up and down there, but not spend a lot of time because it's, it, it's, it's not that great. And this is gonna turn this more into what it was before that house that was previously on this lot that was torn down, that's shown in one of my slides last time and, and in this slideshow at the back end, there was a house there uh, into the early 20th century, further down towards Merrimack Court where we kind of started. But I think this is really creating continuity for this neighborhood that that really fronts on three streets. All right, thanks, Nick. I have uh, I have no further questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, Mr. Delisle. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cracknell, thank you for uh, the very thorough presentation. Uh, I have no questions tonight. All right, thank you, Mr. Delisle. Uh, Mr. Swanton. Uh, yeah, I have a couple questions. I, I just want to follow up on Mr. Moore's question. The way I understand this, uh, not that I'm proposing it's a better plan, but rather than put a second house back there, you could put an addition on the back of the existing house. Uh, it would, of course, require a special permit, but it could be done in such a way that it would not require a variance. That's my understanding of what you guys just concluded. Is that correct? If a special permit was granted, I mean, I, yes, it's correct. If, if you <laughs> were to grant that, you yeah. could do it without a variance. Right, um, that's a very, very simple question. Okay, let's, let me go yeah. to my next question. Um, I, also, Mr. Moore talked about how close the uh, new house, proposed house is to the street. And by the way, I did take a walk down Ken, around there. Just, Ken, just one sec, sorry. I wanna go back to your first question because obviously it's a good question and I don't think I answered it right. And you guys can tell me if I didn't and maybe someone from the planning department could chime in. I'm not entirely sure if that addition has to go, that addition is reasonably going to be placed along Union Place. And we all got that from the last question from Ken. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced it can only be done with a special permit for nonconformities 
because there's a significant intensification of the nonconformity that would is already present with only we're we're only eight inches off the right of way for Union Place today with that current house. I, I, I would, agree, and if you and if you ran it right down the road, you'd have that issue. But if you did it, if you angled it back so it was in the middle of the green area there. Well, we I can't. Mean, you, we can't do that. That's not my point. Is that's unreasonable because, because that that is actually owned by Sam and Michelle. This property is two thirds, one third. If so, if you draw a straight line, look at that addition along Union Place, and carry that line all the way up to the to the uh, top side of the brick walkway going into that blue structure. That it's a two thirds, one third spread on the footprint of the building. So the addition would have to reasonably be placed directly along Union Place, which would significantly intensify the pre existing non conforming setback, which may kick it into a variance because it's intensifying something that's already not supposed to be there versus a special permit for non conformities. So, so I'm not, not sure you can do that without a variance. So you're, you're not looking. Uh, so I just learned something. This is the alternative would not be. In addition to to thirty four thirty six or whatever this thing is, it's three forty four. Three forty four to both units. Somehow no, it's the to one unit. We're talking about five hundred square feet to the smaller unit. I mean, we're 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 just contemplating, as you know, things that are not being asked for. So no, no, I, I understand, but we have to decide as a zoning board whether you have an alternative. And, I, and it, I get that, and, and, and it's that would. So that you would not need a variance, and and I'm not proposing it's the better plan. It just seems to me like we've seen an awful lot of creative developers come through here, and it's would seem to me that blue box could be expanded backwards. Um, and I'd, but, I I would respectfully disagree that the way it would likely a reasonable alteration extension of that structure would be along Union Place where the smaller unit exists, not the bigger unit. So you're not going into the green area there. Uh, in the middle of the lot, it would be near that shade tree we're proposing, and that would be an intensification in, uh, of a pre-existing non-conforming use that I can't sit here in good faith and say is a slam dunk for not needing a variance, because it would be a somebody could make maybe Rob or somebody else can chime in that knows more than me about uh, this subject matter, but when a when a proposal is requested for a special permit for non-conformities, uh, it it's it's often not granted uh, if there's a significant intensification of what's already not supposed to be there, it kicks it into a variance. And I think this is not uh, not clear to me that it wouldn't be in that category. So everything's looking at the same zoning relief in terms of needing potentially a variance. I would rather not take any more time on this question and go to another question, if you don't mind. I'm good. Okay, my next question is, um, I, I too went over there and looked at the stakes and whatnot. And I really appreciate you putting stakes out. It really helps visualize things. Um, but I guess my question is, you're only five feet off the street roughly uh, with the new building. Why didn't you set it back like, you know, 10 feet? I mean, why, why did you want to be quite so close to the street? Well, it, first off, it is, it's five and a half feet at the corner, eight in front of the house and 10 at the other corner. And the existing house is, is eight inches uh, off that street. So we felt like that was a reasonable place to land in the spirit of the ordinance, which treats the rear yard of the house, which has a sliding glass door and it will function as a rear yard, that it be 20 feet instead of 25, or it be 20 feet instead of 10, if we were to slide that house back further or 15, it seemed like the right number, the right sweet spot between uh, getting a reasonable front yard that's consistent with everybody else out there. That front yard is, is similar to just anybody that's in a, a traditionally built house uh, has a front yard that doesn't meet the front yard setback. And it, that, that's why we did it. And maybe it's imperfect, but it seemed like the right, the sweet spot. Between, okay. I, I, yeah. I appreciate that answer. I'd like to go on my next question. Um, if we could go to slide one. Uh, um, slide has disappeared. Oh, there it is. Um, the very top line says a historic preservation project. And later on, you talk about you would hope to go to the, to the historic commission uh, and get a uh, preservation restriction. And I guess what I'm wondering is, I, I assume you haven't been there. So I'm wondering, um, how do you know they're gonna accept it? 
Yeah, we have we have no idea. We have no idea if the planning board is going to accept it. We we there's a lot of unknowns, and what's typically you know you got you got to start somewhere. We didn't file three simultaneous permits. I, I, I think you realize, as all your colleagues do there, you guys are the high water mark. If we don't get dimensional relief, there's no point in talking to anybody about anything because it's not going to be even requested to get a 6C. So we've done our best. We're taking the risk. And, and the good news is, I guess, if you're at all on the, on the fence here, uh, this isn't an approval of this project is not going to assure it's going to get built. I have absolute confidence that the historic commission will do its own independent job and render its own independent decision on whether this should have a preservation restriction and whether this restoration plan is appropriate. They're the ones that should really make that decision and they will. And the planning board, similarly, they could get this, go through their own findings and they could reject it. And we know that. So you know, you, you got to get a permit somewhere first before you can get a permit somewhere else. And no, I, I have enough experience with them to, to, to feel that this is going to be acceptable. But if it isn't, that's our loss. Okay, I hear you. I, I, I guess my concern, I, I, Caitlin, could you put up slide 11? Slide 11, I think you've done a nice job of, of taking a lot of issues that came up on the last meeting from a lot of the abutters, having to do with traffic and parking and view easements and utilities and drainage and all these things. I mean, I served in another municipality for six years on a planning board, and I have a lot of experience going through this laundry list of things. And I think you did a, a nice job of trying to deal with it, even though you're here at the ZBA meeting, not at the planning board. I, and that really is the heart of my issue here. Right after the last meeting, I went and I asked the chair of the planning board, you know, why did you change the law? Why did you change the ordinance? And, you know, I got a somewhat different answer than you got when you asked the vice chair. The answer I got was, well, the idea was we wanted to add lot area so that we would not have negative infills. Okay. Um, so, okay, I've, now I've heard two opinions from different planning board members, from the chair and the vice chair. I, I am very, having been a former planning board member, I am uncomfortable with this amount of planning board topics on something that's just been changed by the planning board um, and where we're getting different opinions from them asking from the outside. I, I think you, you've done a lot of nice things with the project. I think there's a lot of very admirable things about it. If I was on the planning board, I might, might support it. Although I, don't, I wouldn't say that because I'm not familiar with this particular um, ordinance from the planning board's perspective. But I, I commend you for a lot of the things you've done and how you've addressed things. But my issue is much more to do with, um, I don't know, you've been, I don't know how long you've been on the phone here, but We've, uh, we've had several app proposals tonight where people have gone to the uh, Historic Commission with something and really got it cleaned up and come to us and we've approved them. Um, and I'm just uncomfortable with this, having so much planning board content uh, on a bylaw, on, on an ordinance, they just changed. Uh, and I'm not looking for a long answer on this. I'm just expressing my concern and letting you know that I really think you've done an admirable job. I'm just uncomfortable on the board that I'm on. Um, and, so, and I and Ken, I totally respect uh, what you're saying. And all I can tell you is the really good news is they're going to decide whether they like it or not. And I have full respect for Bonnie Sontag, Rick Tainer, and the rest of the planning board. And and I think we have made it abundantly clear, all of us, including you, that this decision by no means is intended at all to prejudice their clear jurisdiction to either accept this project or reject this project. And I included their criteria in the closing slides that were not presented, but in the packet that make it very clear. They have to render their own findings and they have ample discretion and jurisdiction to deny this project should this project in the majority of the planning board be something they do not see as beneficial to this neighborhood or, or the city of Newburyport. I mean, that's just the way it is. They have the right 
to deny this project. And we have all acknowledged it repeatedly in these meetings. So there is, there's nobody, including me, that's going to roll this out should we get it approved and say, hey, they gave it to us. We can't talk about that. That's not what we've ever said. We'll say they are high functioning adults that will render their own decision and they'll respect the fact that you have repeatedly as a group and us as applicants acknowledged their jurisdiction and that we are not trying to trample on it by looking at this project as best we can given where we are in the permitting process, which is right. not the end. No, I realize that. I realize they have to make a separate decision as does the historical commission. I realize that. You know, we had one of these last year on, on Hancock Street where it, it was complicated and we basically backed off and let the applicant get down the path with the planning board and then we approved it. Um, so there's different ways of, of handling this and, and I, I don't have any more questions and I'll, I'll yield my time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swanton and uh, Mr. Channon. I've got no no new questions, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Channon um, and uh, Mr. Benick. I have no questions. I want to uh, appreciate the uh, comprehensive submission, uh, Mr. Krucknow. Thank you. All right. I, I don't have uh, any additional questions either. I, I think just uh, as often happens, the questions get thoroughly vetted along the way. So I appreciate that. Appreciate the responses uh, by Mr. Cracknell. Um, so if there's nothing further, I will close questions from the board and uh, we will move into um, deliberations. And again, uh, I just remind the, uh, the ZBA that we're deliberating um, on the application based on two criteria. Of course, the variance request on lot area and rear, rear yard setback, uh, as well as the special permit for non-conformities. Um, uh, which is the proposal to expand a pre-existing non-conforming structure. Um, so uh, we'll just begin with Mr. Moore. And you can obviously, let's deliberate these uh, together. We're not going to do two, two laps. Um, we'll just deliberate them together in one sort of per member conversation. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Chairman Jim Petty. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to um, just go back to a, a question that I had earlier that was answered on on the setback, and then it came up in in other questions. I think it was from uh, Mr. Swan's question that if the house was set back more, it would end up killing that site easement that is important to an abutter. So um, it is, I would say, for the for the betterment of of abutters that the house, I guess, stay where it is. So uh, just to answer my own question, I guess, because often I like to do that. Um, back to the bigger point. Um, like, like Mr. Swanton, um, you know, granting a 6C variance after uh, there's been a recent change uh, to the ordinance uh, gave me some pause. Um, uh, for all the reasons I think he said, and maybe some of the ones that I've mentioned in the last couple of meetings. But, uh, you know, in, in thinking about it further, I, really, I, I thought that we're often asked to um, determine the intent of a new ordinance or an ordinance change, whether it's tonight, whether it's or whether it's on Plum Island or elsewhere, what was the intent of the ordinance? And I think both um, Ms. Cracknell and uh, my colleague, Mr. Swanton, have both done, attempted to do that, attempted to find out what the intent was and both got slightly different answers. But in my mind, the intent was to spur the conversation that that's just occurred, that if someone is going to propose to to do this where uh, it's already a, a two family use and the lot is, is sufficiently close to uh, the 15,000 foot, foot uh, square foot um, lot size and wants to build a separate structure to continue to just use it as a two family use um, that there's a significant number of hurdles, discussions, conversations that need to happen to, so that all interested parties are, 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 um, are satisfied. And, and as far as the variance goes in, in this case, um, I'm, I, you know, I had questions on whether there was an alternative. Um, I can see how it, it, it wouldn't be the best. I, I, I would agree with uh, Mr. Cracknell that it's, it wouldn't be the best just to bump that out even further. Um, whether my concerns about the placement of the house are, uh, are rooted in anything um, substantive with respect to this variance or not. 
Um, I, I can't agree that a reasonable alternative um, in my mind uh, uh, doesn't exist to what he's trying to do. So if I just strictly look at the variance from that lens, uh, I would say that conditions and circumstances are unique to this lot. Uh, we can all agree it's, it's, um, it's very narrow. It lends itself to, to have the placement of another uh, standalone structure, um, but it has to be done uh, correctly and, and with a lot of planning. And I think that was, that was achieved here. So um, the applicant's lot is very unique when looking at other um, lots in the area in my mind. So I, I think it's satisfied there in, as far as I'm concerned, strip application of this trap chapter would deprive the applicant a reasonable use. Um, it's been permitted in other areas. Yes, there's been a change to uh, 6C, but um, that's why we're here tonight to, to determine whether it, uh, it warrants enough of a, a, a grant of forgiveness that would not constitute special privilege. And I would say it doesn't. Um, and I don't think the unique conditions of the shape of the lot or the, or the three streets that it abuts um, are any uh, result of any actions they've taken. So with respect to the variance, I can find that, um, that I can give a variance to this um, for those reasons. Um, in the special permit for nonconformities, um, there's no new nonconformities created with, uh, with this proposal. Um, and the application won't be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing form of structure. And I can, I, I come to that determination um, with the care that's been taken to the height of the new building. Uh, some of the feedback of the abutters um, saying they, you know, they really appreciate the, the care that's been taken into making this uh, in this lot useful. And the fact that all the changes to the, the buildings themselves will, will improve the site of the, the uh, lot as a whole. So I'll stop my rambling there and I'll let my colleagues improve on that if possible, because that's a mess. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, Mr. Delisle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would, will concur with Mr. Moore uh, this evening um, regarding the variance and the special permit. Um, I thought the last time that we met and voted on this matter that that the applicant had satisfied the, the necessary showing for the variance. And I think, uh, you know, with the additional time to refine the application and collect additional uh, insights into the project and uh, data points regarding the project. And I, I, I do think that, that again here tonight, the applicant meets the, the variance criteria. Uh, I think Mr. Moore went through them pretty pretty well. Um, uh, with regard to the uh, unique circumstances of the lot, I really do think that the, the frontage on three streets makes this a very unique situation. And, and as Mr. Moore said, lends itself to the, the second single family structure further down the lot on a different fronting on a different street. I don't think that this is a situation that really can be replicated uh, all too frequently in town. Um, th this is a really unique property in that regard. And I think the second point is really probably the most critical point in this application. Um, whether the strict applications of the chapter would deprive the applicant of reasonable use. Um, and that, as I said last time we, we voted on this, it goes on to say, in a manner equivalent to the use permitted to be made by other owners of their neighboring lands, structures, or buildings in the same district. Um, and I think the critical fact there is that the very uh, neighbor was able to do this 6C um, previously, and granted the, the ordinance has been changed subsequent to that grant, but that's why we're here on this variance, we can we sit and and have the discretion to grant this variance, and I and I do think that that because of that, uh, the second prong, the most critical prong in my opinion, is uh, is satisfied. And I think Mr. Moore hit the other two well, so I won't uh, reiterate those. Um, so that's the variance with regard to the special permit for the uh, non special permit for nonconformities for the uh, additional structure exceeding 500 square feet. Um, again, I, I think that Mr. Moore hit that well too and that the applicant has satisfied the requirements um, 
for that special permit for nonconformities. So with that, I will uh, I will uh, end my deliberation. Thank you. Rob, I think you're muted, but should I talk now? <laughs> oh, sorry about that. I, um, I thank you, Mr. Delisle. Um, Mr. Swanton, you're next. Sorry, I left that mute on. <laughs> yeah. Thank God you saw my mouth moving though. Yeah, yeah. It's thank God for our cameras. Um, you know, I, I think I've expressed my discomfort. Um, I, I, in a prior lifetime, in another municipality, I was on the planning board for many years and I brought a lot of zoning proposals forward and got them passed. And I feel sorry for whoever brought this one forward and got it passed because here we go the first time it's up and rather than go to the planning board and come here. I wish it was in the other order. It puts us in a tough spot. On the other hand, I think, um, I think there's a lot to like about this proposal. Um, I think it's an improvement uh, on the two family and trying to work with it. Um, I think the abutters are, I heard one abutter was a concern about density, but everybody else was very supportive. Uh, and I think my colleagues, uh, Mr. Moore and Mr. Delisle have made some excellent points. So I'm lukewarmly supporting this. So I will lukewarmly support this. Was that it? Um, yes, I support this. Excellent. I will vote, I will vote right. yes on, on both of the things, variance and special permit. Okay, thank you, Mr. Swanton. And um, Mr. Channon. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll, I'll make a couple of comments, even though I'm not voting. Um, I have to agree with my colleagues. I, I think the hurdle for the variance, uh, can, can, an argument can be made that it's been met. And I feel that the um, special permit for nonconformities has also been met. And, and I think another thing that weighs heavily in my mind is, um, uh, I won't say overwhelming, but strong support from the abutters, from the neighbors. Yeah. Um, you know, a project like this, uh, you know, kudos to the developer and the owners for uh, for working with their neighbors. Um, a project like this, I think, could could garner uh, you know negative support fairly quickly, but it hasn't. Um, I think they've addressed almost all of the neighbors' concerns and the fact that the neighbors would uh, accept this the way it's been proposed um, and support the owners, uh, I think weighs heavily in my mind. So uh, I, I would support this uh, based on, on uh, the comments made by my colleagues and the abutters uh, supporting the, uh, the application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Benick. Yeah, I'll be brief. Uh... Both Mr. Moore and Mr. Delisle articulated my perspective on this, and particularly uh, Mr. Delisle's observations regarding the, the previous approval at 342 Merrimack Street. I find that very compelling, and I believe that Mr. Cracknell and I had a colloquy about that uh, back in December, and it struck me then that that was a significant uh, factor here in our analysis, and it continues to be. Um, I also am uh, quite impressed with the level of cooperation uh, uh, with uh, neighbors uh, and the willingness to um, implement a reasonable uh, request to, to work with the neighbors. Uh, so for these reasons, uh, I, find that, I find that the requirements for the variance and the special permit uh, have been satisfied here. Very good. Um, well, I mean, I, um, I won't really be able to add anything substantive to what's already been said other than I too support both applications. Um, I'm also uh, moved by the unanimity of of support from the neighborhood. And I won't presume to suppose that it's unanimous across everyone, um, but certainly everyone that logged on and that's what we go by. Uh, we can't imagine the sentiment and mindset of people that haven't um, logged on to share it. So uh, I will go with the sentiment and mindset of those that did. And, and it sounds uh, very clear that the applicant and, the, um, and uh, Mr. Kutcher and uh, others uh, made great efforts and great strides to um, to hear and to listen at the same time to the concerns of the abutters and make this a um, a better project hopefully in the end. But 
I think as Mr. Cracknell points out, we're really, we're merely the first, um, perhaps the most critical first stop, or at least I think he described it as highest bar. Um, so I think that it's wise that he has to try to pick his poison and decide which board to come to first, that he comes here first. Um, I think this is gonna be further refined um, significantly. Um, so I feel some comfort and confidence in that process. Uh, so that just reaffirms my support. But technically speaking, I believe that the applicant and the application meet the criteria in my estimation of both the variance as well as the special permit. So I too can support it. Um, and uh, I, unless there's anything further, anyone wish to add any additional comment before I close? Mr. Chairman, um, I believe there are some conditions that were gonna be, um, that were gonna be shown. I think Caitlin, I just interrupted you. I apologize. But I think you were going the same way. Yes. That there were conditions that that's we need right. to uh, enter into the record for anyone that that's online and watching right that's now. That's true. Um, excellent. Thank you for reminding me, Mr. Moore. So, um, for anyone watching um, through Zoom uh, or following along, uh, take a look at the slide that's up. It it reads: Final three th three forty four Merrimack Street draft special conditions for consideration by the ZBA. Um, originally, this was a list of some, um, uh, you know, a lengthy list of conditions, uh, but with significant amount of, uh, of guidance from the planning office uh, and the applicant, they've been distilled down to um, these six conditions. So if the board were to consider a motion, uh, a favorable motion to approve these applications, it is encouraged to do so with the inclusion of these um, additional conditions and this is also going to be posted to the city's website. This is available for further scrutiny, but I, I wanted to make sure that we remembered to put it up so that anyone watching could uh, take a moment and take a look. Um, and uh, condition one um, is uh, as shown on the revised plan, a view easement across a portion of 344 Merrimack Street. And Mr. Cracknell went through all of these during his presentation, but this is a clean way to enumerate uh, and see it in black and white, exactly how we as a board could memorialize those promises, those conditions, those, um, um, you know, those, um, um, you know, that cooperation that was reached through the neighborhood involvement. Um, the uh, number two is um, final construction drawings associated with the building permit. Um, shall conform to the present at uh, the presented elevations. Uh, number three, uh, the existing mature elm tree that was shown on the eastern property boundary uh, of the revised plan will be preserved. And I'm summarizing this, but please feel free to, you can see the additional detail. Um, of course, number four, prior to any construction, um, the owner shall provide the zoning administrator with copies of all the executed recorded easements granting access to DPS, to the paved portions of Union Place, um, as well as the other easements and view easements that um, have been that have been mentioned and referenced in the uh, in uh, Mr. Cracknell's presentation. Um, also, number five, um, construction activities. Prior to any construction activities, um, a construction management plan will be submitted to ZBA. And and basically, what that the reason that matters is that there's going to be a lot of impact in a very close, intimate neighborhood. It's important. Um, for the city as well as our volunteer citizen boards to make sure that we, um, we hold every applicant and whether they're a developer or whether they're a builder or just a homeowner, we hold every applicant accountable to, to sort of the kind neighbor um, rule. And, uh, and that is more than simply kindness and neighborliness. neighborliness. We actually try to um, establish criteria. So there will be rules of, uh, of engagement as it were so that uh, it's as uh, palatable as possible for the immediate abutters during the disruption period of construction. And then finally, uh, all new fencing shown on the revised plan um, will be installed prior to occupancy. So that makes sure that that gets done. So I think that's a quick run through of these conditions. Um, any uh, member of the ZBA, any, any additional comments before we close um, deliberations? We'll incorporate, um, if I can ask any motion, whoever crafts the motion to just kindly make reference, and merely making reference to the incorporation of the six uh, special conditions is, is fine for the motion. But anything further before we move there? Hearing none, uh, I will close the um, deliberations portion of the public hearing and now we will go into the uh, member vote. So uh, with that, I'll ask, uh, do we have a motion to approve? 
Uh, I'll make, Mr. Moore, I'll make a motion to approve the variance application for 344 Merrimack Street. That's uh, VAR 21 31 or three, sorry, three, um, with the final list of special draft conditions provided by, by the planning department and um, partially summarized by you this evening in this meeting. Very good. And we have a second. I'll second, I'll second that. that, Mr. Delisle. All right, motion's made, thank you. Motion's made by Mr. Moore and seconded by Mr. Delisle. Um, and we will take these one at a time. So let's, um, we'll start with, um, and actually, I, Mr. Moore, which, the, you made I a motion the, to approve which one? I did the variance. Very good, okay. So a uh, motion has been made and seconded on the application for uh, variance docket 21-3, lot area and rear yard setback, calling the roll. Uh, Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Delisle? Yes. Um, Mr. Channon? Uh, I'm, I'm Mr. sorry, Mr. Channon, you're yep. not voting, correct? Correct. Oh, right. So um, allow me to just restart, just for clarity. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Delisle? Yes. Mr. Swanton? Yes. Mr. Benick? Yes. Rob Champetti, I vote yes. That's five in the affirmative. The ayes have it. The motion carries and the variance 21-3 uh, is approved. Um, do we have a motion um, to approve the special permit for nonconformities, expansion of pre-existing nonconforming structure? Greg, I have a question. And I, and I will move. Oh, I'm sorry, Greg, before that, do, do we have to attach these conditions to the special permit for nonconformities as well or no? Yes, we should. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll, I will move that uh, we approve uh, application ZNC 21 8 for 3344 Merrimack Street, uh, including the uh, special conditions uh, previously uh, referred to by the chairman. Second. Okay, thank you. A motion is made by Mr. Benick with the um, with the attachment of the special conditions um, cited earlier, and it's been seconded by was it Mr. Moore? Yes. Um, all right. Motion's been made and seconded on the special permit for nonconformity. He's calling the roll. Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Delisle. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Mr. Swanton. Yes. Mr. Benick. Yes. Rob Champetti, I vote yes. That is five in the affirmative. The ayes have it. The motion carries and. The special permit for nonconformities on 21-8 is also approved. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Cracknell and, uh, and Mr. Kutcher, and to all of the uh, neighbors and abutters that took the time to come out this late evening and, and offer your, uh, your comments, your thoughts, and be part of the process. We certainly thank you. It makes our job um, a, a bit easier to understand where, uh, where folks are coming from. So thank you. Thank you, members. Thank, thank you, so, Rob. Thank you, Rob. thank you very much. Yes. Rob, just, just real quick, I would be remiss if I didn't thank you all for your your time your due diligence your consideration of of what we've gone through here in the last couple of months you know i think most of you i, I don't know most of you personally uh, my day job is a municipal planner i work full time with planning boards historic commissions and zoning boards of appeals in portsmouth and i think uh i, I think you guys did a fantastic job uh putting us through a level of effort that hopefully everybody should go through uh, to do a great job for the city and, and give us a fighting chance. Thankfully, it, it wasn't Groundhog Day and we were not back in December. Uh, and I think you really challenged us to address those issues and, and reach out to the neighbors, listen better, and come up with a better way to make this project a greater success. And so whatever happens at the Historic Commission or the Planning Board, that's beside the point. I think you know, I, I'm I'm proud to say you guys represent the city of Newburyport, a city I love, even though I don't live there. And I, I again commend you for again not making this easy. It shouldn't be. And I'm glad I was able to work as hard as you to to uh, to work with the neighbors and get where we are. So thanks for your time, and I appreciate it. Thanks very much. That those are those are kind nice. sentiments. We appreciate it, and good luck. Thank you. All right. Very good. So uh, that uh, concludes our uh, public hearings for this evening. We'll close public hearings and our agenda. We're going to open up our business meeting and uh, undertake the approval of the minutes. We have the minutes from Gretchen Joy for uh, January 25th, 2022. Um,
Do, um, do we have any comments or revisions? Uh, or in the absence of that, do we have a motion to approve? So moved, Ken Swanton. All right. Motion Mr. Moore. Made by Mr. Swanton and seconded by Mr. Moore on the approval of the minutes of 125-22. Uh, calling the roll, Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Delisle? Yes. Mr. Swanton? Yes. Mr. Chagnon? Yes. Mr. Benick? Yes. Yes. Uh, many vote yes. Six in the affirmative. The ayes have it. Motion carries. Minutes are approved. Thank you. Um, lastly, um, we have uh, put on the agenda at my at my request the um, and I think we've all talked about this the discussion of rules and regulations section four point three. It's within our uh, it's within our authority to refine and define sort of um, you know uh, the the bylaws that govern how we do business. I think it's with the spirit of full disclosure and public input or at least public awareness. Um, that I ask that it be put onto this agenda so that everyone had fair notice or anyone who cared. <laughs> um, and I think it's, um, you know, it's a limiting factor that, uh, you know, I think I had proposed for everyone to discuss and, and see where we land. But I'd like to um, set a bylaw that going forward, we never uh, put more than five matters on any agenda docket. Uh, and in the, um, in, in the form of any continuance, that we, um, of course, within discretion, um, we adhere to that to that five docket rule as well. And I think it's 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 the best version of ourselves to not be saddled into the you know into the late evening after working all day as we all do um, with all the other commitments we have. But it's also it's in the interest of the community and the public to not sit in on something like that, um, possibly late in the evening, and expect to you know expect that to sort of be, you know, a fair shake. So I think if we limit it to five uh, and we, we uh, obviously my proposal of the change would propose to allow for discretion, um, you know, to uh, grant relief to that limit. And we can undertake that in a case by case basis on a majority vote of the board. Um, let's say for instance, we know we have something that's very, very quick and something else that's also very, very quick comes on. We, we, may, we may want to, um, put both on, just in the just in the in the interest of moving two things on and off our docket and getting them done. Uh, it may be in our interest to do that to keep things moving at a pace. But I but I want to make sure that the applicants and the pool of you know applicant and public constituents that are out there um, are on you know full and fair notice that uh, we are going to hold that line you know of five on real substantive applications. So that everybody has a fair understanding of the the tempo of our our you know of our work, and you know we can have an expectation of getting off Zoom you know by 10 10 30 instead of 11 30 12 o'clock. So those are my thoughts. That's my proposal, um, and this is the uh, the time to discuss it. Tell me what you think, or whether we want to frame it up. Yeah, well, can I ask a question? Good. Good. Sure. Thanks. Um, with regard to the, the limit of five, would a minor modification count towards that limit or is it just uh, public hearings? Um, the, um, I, it was just for public hearings. Um, okay. And um, however, you know, we, you know, we should exercise sort of, we, I, I think we should exercise the, you know, the, the privilege of being sort of our, our thinking selves. If we see something coming with the help of you know, Caitlin, um, with the help of Andy, um, that is going to be really lengthy, even though it's a minor modification, let's say it has a lot of public, in, in, you know, let's just say for whatever reason, it's coming through, and it's going to be tedious, we can exercise our discretion and say, you know, all right, we, we will count that, one. Um, or we will, um, you know, we'll, we'll dock it that in a way that's thoughtful to the rest of the docket um, of that particular evening, and we'll have to rely on, on, um, you know, on Caitlin and the planning office to sort of be our advance eyes on that. But if we give them sort of the guidance of this new bylaw, then they're well advised. And I think they'll exercise their best judgment to try to keep it, you know, keep it um, at a, at a, uh, at a reasonable docket volume. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, you bet. Anyone else? Jennifer has her hand up. Oh, sorry. I didn't see. I didn't notice that. Do we. I thought. I thought Jennifer. Jennifer Blanchet gets to just talk whenever she wants. She. She's our zoning. Our zoning administrator. I didn't know we had to. We had to recognize you. But. But. What. what I just thought saying? I'd wait my turn. Yeah. Uh, I, I am 
just curious. Um, I know Diane was curious for clarification on this. When, when we are scheduling in the office new public hearings, we do currently limit them to four new public hearings on any agenda. Uh, so I think perhaps what is happening, and, and this may be a management thing more than, a, than an ordinance change issue, um, where we get continuances at the last minute, I think is where you're seeing public hearings piling up. So I, right. I did hope to have you clarify um, mm -hmm. your, your intent here. If this is somehow limiting the ones we're scheduling for their first hearing to four or five as the case may be, or if you're saying uh, there can be no continuances beyond can, you know, so, putting five on the agenda. Yeah, so I mean, it's a great question. You know, Jennifer, it's a great question. Uh, my, my proposed intent, and this is subject to the, the sentiment of the rest of the board, my proposed intent was to make five the, the hard, you know, the, the hard deck, the no fly zone beyond. And that includes continuances. So I, I do recognize that I went through an inventory of like the last year's agenda. And I did recognize that a lot of what's happened has been just the bump through of continuances and it clobbers us. And sometimes it's just like overwhelming, right? Because we can have several continuances. Um, I think we just have to consider five as five and that's inclusive of continuances um, because at the end of the day, it's the same thing. A continuance is being continued because it was too long likely to be finished or it couldn't be finished or it got refined or maybe it was just scheduling. Um, but whatever the case is, we have to assume that it has the ability to be as full a, a hearing as any other hearing when it actually goes, you know, goes full forward. So the only way to really kind of protect the spirit of this sort of docket limit is to is to presume that everything that's landing, with the exception of minor modifications, everything else that's landing is a public hearing. And whether it's continued or not, um, you, you know, it's still it's still a it will occupy a segment on our docket. And I think, you know, we should plan for five. Um, so does that I don't know if that's is that clear or does that clarify uh, this is andy I, I certainly think for the office it's clear the uh from our perspective we have a uh, the five cap and then obviously we'd be checking with you if there's anything beyond that yeah. we understand the board itself has its discretion uh, can continue to to have more items and have a seven item agenda if it wishes um, but we understand from our our perspective that we'll be um, holding to the five and letting applicants know that they'd be uh, out to the next agenda if right necessary. i mean that's that's basically what we would hope you know and um it's you guys, you know, in the planning office, you already have a tough job. And, and so regrettably, we're adding maybe one more task, but I think it's a, I think it's a task that will, that will relieve some of the, um, some of the pressures in that, you know, you hold the line, you know, as a representative voice before we even see anything to the public that it's, you know, it's five. And if there's, you know, in your judgment, and you guys know better than us, if you, if it looks like there's a, you know, there's a rationale to be able to slip in a, you know, a sixth. We, I think it's in our interest to get something quick done, even if it's, even if numerically it pops over the five, because otherwise it's just going to be kicked down the road. You know, if we can get it done and still sort of meet the spirit of what we're trying to do, which is to be able to be, you know, not overly tired and taxed and not, you know, overly fatigued and, and dragged into the evening, then that's, you know, that's what I think we would want to do. So you guys will have that line and hold that line. And then if there's something to discuss, we can discuss it as a board. Um, you know, offline in advance and see whether the board is, you know, in a majority feels like we should add that sixth to the- I'd, uh, I'd, like, to make a, I'd like to make a comment. Sure, please. Because um, I, I think sometimes it's not the number of them, it's, it's, it's the complexity of them. I mean, you can almost tell looking at the agenda if it's going to be a long night or not, based on how many of them are going to have an awful lot of participants and go forever. Uh, I guess my question would be, what happens if you put five of them on and it's, 11 o'clock at night and it's we've only made it through four of them i mean I, I almost think this should be a as part of this we should think about having an end point where you know we don't ask people to go beyond a certain hour um because i just think it's don't not fair to the public it's not fair to us i don't think people are yeah. getting a quality I, discussion i, I mean I, I, totally, I totally agree with that ken I, I'm, I'm sorry i didn't mean to cut you off yeah, I, I was, the last board i was on was the board of selectmen and we used to have this thing whereas if you got to 10 30 at night you didn't start a new agenda topic unless you had an unanimous vote of the board, hmm. uh, unless it was that important, uh, because it is generally was never a good idea and it didn't really do justice to whatever the topic was. 
So, so I, I'm, I'm kind of, I guess that's my concern. You, you have a limit of five, that's great. But if you have three of these, like a brine and a, you know, and a two Neptune and a couple of them on the same meeting, good luck. You're not going to make it through five of them. Um, oh. And so I, I almost think this should also be a sort of a, 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 a stated point that we don't go beyond a certain hour because it's just not fair without Mr. Delisle having to say, hey, guys, let's stop. <laughs> right. If, if, if I could, I, you know, I, I, I appreciate that sentiment, Ken. And, and so my thinking is this. Um, first, it's, it's really four plus one because the planning office already dockets only four new, new you know, public hearings. We're, we're assuming that there's always gonna be one continuance that needs to have sort of like a reserved seat, which is right. where that five came from. But what I'd like to do, and, and tell me if, if this, um, you know, if, if you feel this is uh, sort of a reasonable way to proceed, I'd like us to start here and then keep a close eye on how things go. And if we see that happening, we will revisit this very type of, you know, uh, of, of um, uh, business meeting to address going further and doing a time limit. But I, 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 I'm only resistant to the time limit because what happens is if we let people come into the room, so to speak, whether it's Zoom or whether it's eventually, hopefully soon back in the council chambers, once they're there, you know, getting bumped at 1030 doesn't feel much better than getting, you know, it, it's still, I think we still have kind of a little bit of a responsibility, not just to ourselves, but to, um, to you know, to not, to not have people wait around only to get bumped late at night. I want to try to avoid that. So I, I, I'd be up, I mean, I would be in support of a time, a drop dead sort of time limit um, if we found that this limitation wasn't working for us. Even if it happened once, it's going gonna, it's gonna to alarm us all and we'll come right back and revisit it. But um, what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, would, would, would that be reasonable or? I, I don't mind trying it, but I just don't like the idea of going past 11. I just don't think, I, I don't think we're yeah. getting a quality, a quality uh, judgment out of us. No question. What, what does everyone else think? I mean, do we want to, I mean, that would be a step, you know, even more, um, uh, even more limiting than I, you know, I'd originally thought, but I, I certainly want to hear what everyone thinks about, in addition to the docket limit of five, you know, of a hard five, um, to also having a time limit of 11 p.m.? You could have a time limit of 11 unless we unanimously agree to continue to, if it's like totally obvious to everybody, you know, just got another five minutes here, let's get it done. But I just, like the one where Stephen blew the whistle, I think that was pretty obvious that we should stop there to all of us. Hmm. Um, okay, um, let me just go around the horn real quick and see what everyone thinks. Um, what um, Mark, what are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's a good idea. And I think the, um, I think the, the docket being five, since I think you said, and I think it's been brought up, I think Jennifer mentioned it too, it's like the, the issue, well, everyone knows that the issue with our docket getting jammed is the number of continuances. And oftentimes we get pressured into doing the next weeks because it's kind of a minor thing and they've been putting it off and, and, you know, the onus will be on us to say no yeah, on the continuance. Sure. So so we have a lot of control over the continuance calendar if we choose to do it and we just should do, we should do that. So I think five is good. I think, you know, we'll, we'll be able to be firmer with our continuances and not just give in to the next one because we, we feel pressure to um, and convinced. And on the time limit, if it's well, if it's a, I mean, I think the majority vote, I think makes a lot of sense because uh, I think we're all in agreement. There's only so much brain power in a day. And, and I, I agree. And I, I think that if it's long as it's said, you know, in a majority unanimous, right? Not majority. Um, I think that's a good way to go. Um, okay. Uh, what is, what do we, what do, Stephen, what do you think? Uh, certainly there is a, a diminishing return after a certain, a certain hour. Um, that is, that is for sure. Um, I think that, you know, it makes sense and maybe, maybe, you know, us taking a step like that would um, would also cause our applicants to sort of economize, um, you know, uh, the limited time of this board rather than the unlimited time of the board. Yeah, I, I you know, I'm going to take the thinking sort of one step further. I do want to hear from everyone else, and I will in a sec. But you know, um, perhaps rather than a sort of on mass time limit, should it be uh, a time limit per applicant because Take, for example, a 46 slide application versus, you know, one applicant with a screened in porch 
at the end. Um, that could happen, right? You know, so there's like a, there's almost a built-in disequity in this time limitation. You know, it's front end loaded favorably to the earlier docketed applications, yeah. right? So I think we, um, well, that, that, that's just my out loud thought. Um, let's see, um, who haven't, who hasn't spoken, uh, Bud? And I, I guess I'm in, I'm in agreement with the um, five, five applicants applications per uh, per session. I don't know about the time limit. It, it's it's hard, uh, be, it, specifically because of how what you just brought up. Um, we could have a 46 slide guy come up in the first uh, first two and a half hours, and uh, you know we've got we've got three to go. Um, yeah, I I don't know. It's it's almost like we have to. You have to be strong enough as a group just to say enough is enough some nights. Yeah, um, you know, um, that's my thinking too. And it's it thinking at it one more step. And then I, I think Mr. Benick hasn't spoken. Um, the 46 slide presentation will tend to be from the more sophisticated applicant, which means the more um, resourced applicant. So that time limit without it being incremental to the application places an advantage, I think, to the more resourced, sophisticated applicant, and and I think thereby, arguably, could disadvantage the you know the regular guy <laughs> who's just coming in and you know plan to just say a few things, show a few pictures, and hope for the best. Um, you, you know, and I, I think that it, we should think about that as well. We we live in a you know a community where there's there's a great level of sophistication you know that goes before all of these boards and commissions. And, and that's a, you know, that's a shield and a sword. It just means that, you know, we have to expend a lot more brain power into the late evening to really think about this. You know, we're often in, an, in a battle of experts. Uh, we have, you know, multiple attorneys with five, six page me legal memoranda, right? <laughs> and we're expected to render an answer on the fly and on the spot. Um, mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, most of us are not lawyers, you know, uh, and for those that are, I can tell you, and I know Stephen and, and Mr. Benick, you know, would, would certainly, I mean, you know, Greg and, and Stephen would surely agree, you know, men and women who wear black robes, they, they usually get clerks and have, I don't know, a half a day to write something, probably more like several weeks, but yeah, we're still expected to, to sift through legal memoranda, um, pro and con, and render a decision on the spot, you know, so that, that I think that, you know, if we're going to do the time limit, um, I don't know, I, I'd be, I'd be, I would support it, but I would, I think we shouldn't do it right away because my fear is that it could, I don't want it to end up being matted first, but that's my thinking. But, and, and Greg, I, we haven't heard from you. So I want to make sure you, you, you know. I, I, just, I don't well, want to I, have Greg. I just want to say, I, I'm not proposing a time limit. I just think we should stop at 11. That's all. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I get reluctant to try to memorialize the, this discretion about our agenda and how long we operate. Uh, by adopting rules and regulation and bylaws. I think the board has broad discretion to, uh, you know, terminate, the, you know, conclude the hearing, organize its agenda as it sees fit. Uh, I mean, I think it would be helpful in my perspective to at least announce that there is a practice, a general practice and procedure that we will conclude our activities by 11 o'clock okay. and people and applicants if they're on the agenda and we're on item two and they're item four and it's 10 30 uh, and we don't get to them i don't think rob i i don't feel too bad about the fact that they have to come back i mean i i, I don't okay. um and we can adjust the agenda we, we know which ones will be longer uh, i i so i i would simply suggest we consider just adopting a guidance or a procedure or whatever you want to call it I, uh, that you know it will be our practice to limit uh, matters to five and to conclude our deliberations by 11 a 11 p.m and applicants should be mindful of that and we should be mindful of that as we are sitting there uh, okay. that's kind of my perspective on it I, um, I appreciate that, Greg. I mean, I think we're saying the same thing that the, you know, adoption of a practice or a guidance, we actually have a mechanism within our, you know, within our, um, our um, 
enablement and it's a bylaw. So I think we could okay. just simply right. call it a bylaw. You know, we adopt the bylaw. And What's then a word? Like, I don't, yeah, doesn't make it. It's the best kind of guidance or, you know, suggestion yeah. because the public, you know, has due notice of it. It's part of the procedural, you know, um, landscape. So, and I just want, if it's out there, then it means that they can look it up, you know, and, and that they can, they'll know it. And, and the office has the, the, you know, the ability to say, look, this is, this is the, the yeah. bylaw. But um, all right, so I, I guess I'm just saying any anything, any bylaw guidance, whatever it is, it's a bylaw, I guess, under our yeah, practice I mean, and procedures, be as flexible as possible to give us our discretion to run our agenda and our hearing as we reasonably see fit. Okay, that's all. Um, We're probably saying the same thing. We all are saying the same. Thing. I think so, but I, I mean, I think this is all important, and I apologize because it's already a late evening. But you know, if we don't. It's like we almost, you know, if we don't plug up the hole in the boat, we're just going to keep talking about how wet we are, you know, so we, we really have to <laughs> take the time to do that and, and then hope for, you know, a drier tomorrow. <laughs> um, so um, I guess with that, do what I can do, I mean, what I'd like to do is I'd like us to, you know, to, to just have a vote and, and, and see if, um, do I, do I hear you guys in that we're all in agreement on a uh, bylaw proposal that will limit hard limit the docket to five and and give us the, the discretion to change that as we as we need to. Does anybody disagree with that um, or not want to proceed with going toward a bylaw? So then, I guess what I would do is um, I will um, I no I I can't as the chair I can't make the motion so someone else has to um, I can just sort of prompt the discussion. But if we make a motion and then I run the um, the vote and the roll, uh, then it becomes our published bylaw, and the uh, planning office has the uh, will will have the ability to enforce it and bring to our attention any exceptions that they believe are you know are um, appropriate. Right, I'll make a motion to uh, adopt a, a bylaw for the board that um, limits the number of items on our agenda uh, at any one time to five. Yeah, it's great. Second it, Bud Shagman. All right. Thanks, Bud. Motion's made by Mr. Moore and seconded by, by Bud Shagman on um, a uh, uh, a new bylaw for the Zoning Board of Appeals to limit the do a docket on any given hearing night to five applications, whether they be continuances or new public hearings um, with the discretion of the board to grant relief um, You know, when uh, the board sees fit, I guess. Is that is that a fair restatement, Mark? That's not what you said exactly, but just so that no, you put a lot more color onto it. That uh, makes sense. I don't presume to need to put any words in your mouth. I just want to no, make sure I, that, like, poor, uh, <laughs> poor. I, I uh, have a not. I have a not so wonderful economy with down. words. So no, it's all good. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, hey, Rob, hey, Rob. Don't you mean by discretion of the board chair, not not by the board? The board can't. Um, right. I actually envision it to be more inclusive than that, you know, by a majority but, of the board. But you're the one, but you're the one making up the agenda. We can't do that as a group. Um, okay. By then we'll start there. And if it looks like it's a problem, we can revisit it. Um, you're right. That becomes like an administrative pain. Um, so um, I think we have the motion that's made and seconded uh, with discretion uh, by the chair on, on any relief. Uh, calling the roll, Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Delisle. Yes. Mr. Swanton. Yes. Mr. Chadman. Yes. Mr. Benick. Yes. And I vote yes. That's six in the affirmative. The ayes have it, and the motion carries. The uh, bylaw um, on section four point three on the agenda is adopted. So, um, Jennifer, Caitlin, does that? And and um, I don't know if Andy, Andy, you're here too. Does that all make sense? Does that seem clear? You know, you guys have to honestly, you have to work with it. It does. Make it fair. Thank you. All right. Great. Um, I have no other updates. Um, and um, I don't, you know, I think, I think we've hit everything we wanted to hit this evening. Um, Andy, Andy, do you have any updates or anything you want to point Not out? Not at the moment. Thank you. Um, the short-term rental units uh, is coming back on uh, discussion on the 16th. Um, if you're interested in tracking the planning board and city council hearing. Yep. That's all. Thank you. Thanks for that reminder. Um, okay. Um, do we have a motion to adjourn? No, no moved. moved. All right. Motion's made and seconded. All those in favor, just say aye. 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 The ayes have it. And uh, 
meetings adjourned. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate the extra time. Have a good, have a good night. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice yeah. evening. Good night, everyone. Good night. Take care. Good night.